All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to ASMFC's Atlantic Striped Bass Management Board meeting. My name is Marty Gary. I'm your chairman from the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Our vice chair is Megan Ware from the state of Maine. Our technical committee chair is Nicole Langill Costa from Rhode Island. Our AP, AP chair is Lou Pisano from New Jersey. And our law enforcement representative is Jeff Mercer from Rhode Island. I'm joined at the front table to my right by Tony Kearns and Dr. Katie Drew. And as Tony just noted, uh, mentioned, uh, notably absent today is Emily Franca, uh, who's out of maternity leave. And again, congratulations to Emily and her husband on the birth of their, their new uh, child. So we'll go ahead and move into, uh, into today's meeting. And um, the first order of business is approval of the agenda. What I'd like to say up front is uh, we did have a request to modify the agenda and shift the order of issues in the agenda because of the background of the draft addendum and the information relates both to the emergency action and the addendum. We were asked to go first over the background section of the draft addendum and then go to the emergency action, then finish the draft addendum. So that change has been suggested and I'm, I'm as chair inclined to accept it, but if there's any opposition, we'll consider it. Is there any opposition to that modification in the agenda? Seeing none, are there any other modifications, additions to the agenda today? Seeing none, the agenda is approved by consent. Next, we'll move into the approval of the proceedings from May 2023. Are there any edits to the proceedings from May 2023? Seeing none, we'll, we'll approve those proceedings from May 2023. Next, we'll move into public comment. These are for items that are not on the agenda, and I'm going to look for raised hands in the audience, and I'll ask Tony uh, to look online to see if there's any raised hands for public comment for items that are not part of our agenda today. I do not see any raised hands in the audience. Are there any online, Tony? None online? Okay, so our next item uh, on the agenda is consider approval of fishery management plan review and state compliance for the 2022 fishing year. Tony will present the FMP review for 2022 which will include plan review team recommendations. And after that presentation, the board will need to determine whether there's any direction needed to be given uh, to the PRT recommendations um, and we'll consider approval of the FMP review. So Tony, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Strike Bass Plan Review Team reviewed state compliance reports and compiled the FMP review for the 2022 fishing year. This was included in the supplemental materials for the board. Today, um, I'm going to highlight some of the key points that were in the document. There is a lot of detail in the FMP review. Um, but I will touch on the stock status, the status of the FMP, management measures and the PRT comments and recommendations. And as Marty just noted, um, our action will be considering approval of the FMP review and state compliance reports at the end. So for the status of the stock, um, there was a 2022 benchmark um, stock assessment update. The striped bass is, stock is overfished, but overfishing is um, not occurring. We use data through 2021, um, and the next stock assessment update is in progress and will be delivered in 2024. Uh, this figure shows the spawning stock biomass in blue and recruitment um, as the reddish bars. You can see the female SSB has declined since the time series high in 20. 2003 and has been below the SSB threshold since 2013. For age one recruitment, there's been a period of low recruitment since about 2005. We have had some strong year classes, the 11, 14, and 15. Um, however, uh, and then um, and then some sort of slightly above average in uh, 2018 as well. For fishing mortality, you can see that F um, was uh, estimated to be at or above the F threshold or uh, below the F threshold, which indicates um, overfishing is not occurring. 
The 2022 was the third year of Addendum 6 implementation. Addendum 6 measures were designed to reduce total removals by 18% relative to the 2017 levels. I'll go through how well we're doing um, with that in a later slide. As you all know, we had some commercial reductions as well as um, recreational reductions. The uh, recreational slot limit was changed to 28 to 30, uh, less than 35 at one fish per day in the ocean. And the bay fishery was set at 18 for a minimum size limit for one fish per day. Moving on to the status of the fishery, this fishery shows the performance over time by sector. At the bottom is the commercial harvest in blue. The commercial discards are shown in red. Um, and they've been relatively stable over time. This is due to impacts of commercial quotas. Most removals are coming from the recreational sector. The rec harvest is in green and the rec release mortality is in purple. Total rec removals account for 90% of all removals and total commercial removals account for 10% of the removals. Um, in 2022, striped bass removals were estimated at 6.8 million fish, which is a 32% increase from 2021. Here on the screen is the removals, um, is the proportion of removals by sector over the past couple years. 2022 is the bottom row, um, and the harvest is 9%. Dead discards is 1% for commercial. For recreational, it was 51% harvest and 39% um, release mortality. For the commercial fishery, and I apologize, that should be 2022 at the top. Um, harvest was estimated, our harvest was 4.28 million pounds in 2022. This is a 7% decrease by weight from 2021. Uh, for commercial utilization of the quota, the ocean fishery utilization increased to 79% in 2022 um, from 76 in 21, and the Chesapeake Bay utilization of their quota decreased uh, to 80% from 83% in uh, 2021. For the recreational fishery, um, total recreational catch coastwide was estimated at 33.1 million fish in 2022, which is a 38% increase from 21. Under the same management measures from 2020 to 2021, total rec harvest in 2022 increased to, um, increased to 3.4 million fish. This is an 88% increase by number relative to 2021. This increase was likely due to the increased availability of the 2015 year class in the ocean slot. Uh, New Jersey landed the largest portion of recreational harvest, uh, followed by New York, Maryland, and Massachusetts. The proportion of coastwide recreational harvest in the Bay was estimated at 20% in 2022 compared to 35% in 21. By weight, the proportion of recreational harvest in the Bay was estimated at 9% in 22 compared to 20% in 21. This decrease in the proportion of recreational harvest from the Bay and therefore an increased proportion of ocean harvest aligns with the availability of the strong 2015 year class the vast majority of recreational striped bass catch, over 90%, is released alive due to the angler preference or regulations. The stock assessment assumes, based on previous studies, that 9% of those fish released alive will die as a result um, of being caught. In 2022, recreational anglers caught and released an estimated 29.6 million fish of which 2.7 million are assumed to have died. This is a 3% increase in live releases from 21. And for in 2022, the combined private and shore modes of the recreational striped bass fishery accounted for 95% of recreational removals. And the for hire component accounted for 5%. Coastwide in 2022, 
private vessel and shore mode recreational removals increased by 42%, while the four higher removals decreased by 7%. This trend differs by region and by mode. Um, the PRT notes that there are several factors that contribute to trends in the recreational catch and effort, including year class availability, overall stock abundance, near shore availability of bait and striped bass, as well as angler behavior, the relatively strong 2015 year class moving into the ocean and becoming available within that ocean slot is likely the primary driver of this increased recreational catch in the ocean for 22. Angler effort and behavior has also um, and important to consider when there are more, more fish available in the fishery, effort can often increase in response to that. So moving into the status of our management measures, um, as I said before, we look at the performance of the measures um, from Addendum 6 relative to the coastwide harvest in 2017, and in 2022, only a 3.5% reduction in total removals coastwide in numbers of fish was realized relative to total removals in 2017. We believe that this is due to the increase in the ocean recreational harvest in 2022 with that 2015 year class. The report also includes the state-by-state -state realized change in the rec removals. Here on the screen, you can see the realized changes from 2017 to 2022 for each state. Um, it shows the predicted reduction in removals from the state conservation equivalency plans where applicable. The PRT notes that there are differences in performance, and those are influenced by many factors. That includes changes in effort, fish availability, year class, and environmental factors. Some of the states saw increased recreational releases, which contributes to the states realizing a less than predicted reduction. The PRT also notes that there is a ton of year-to-year -year availability, even under consistent regulations. The report also includes state-by-state uh, -state percent change in commercial harvest by weight from 2017 to 2022. Um, and percent change in commercial quota implemented through Addendum 6, including the conservation equivalency plans that went along with it. The realized changes shown here are for 2022 compared to 2017, um, which are different than the realized changes comparing 2020 to 2017 because commercial harvest levels have changed. And you can see they vary anywhere from 18 to uh, 1.8% in the negative. As of May 2022, um, the new Amendment 7 recruitment trigger is effective. Uh, that trigger is that if any of the four JIIs used in the stock assessment model, um, those include New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia's, um, show an index value that is below 75% of all values from 1992 to 2006. That's the high recruitment period. Um, if those values are below for three consecutive years, then an interim F target and an interim F threshold that's calculated using the low recruitment assumption will be implemented and the management triggers will be reevaluated using those interim reference points. Um, the Maryland JI uh, meets that trigger criteria. We are actually already using this low recruitment scenario, so there isn't a change that we have to do. And the stock assessment is also being, that for 2024, is being conducted using that low recruitment assumption. This figure just shows the um, four JAIs. Um, starting from the top left is New York. Their JAI has been above the trigger level for the past three years. Um, New Jersey is top, top right, and that trigger has been below for the last two years. And then on the bottom, Maryland, with their uh, four, it's actually four years below the trigger level, and Virginia was below its trigger level for the past two years.
in 2022, all states have implemented a management and monitoring program that is consistent with the provisions of the FMP. Last year, Emily went through three inconsistencies that were found by the PRT, but the board did not um, raise any concerns with these. So it was noted that we wouldn't go over them with the board, but they still um, are there. They are in the, listed in the document. Um, there were no de minimis requests from the states. The PRT recommends that the board task um, the PRT with uh, review of the commercial tagging program at regular intervals, and they would like to start to do this for next year um, to review the program components, such as biological metrics used to allocate the tags. And unless I hear the board does not want the PRT to do this, um, the PRT will go ahead and carry forward with this action just to be super clear. <laughs> um, and then also for the, the PRT also noted that for the incidental catch requirements, um, many states have implemented the provision as written or very close to as written in amendment seven. Some of the states referred to alternative regulatory language instead of having specific um, language related to striped bass, it's language that's related to other species as well. Um, but that language notes that anglers can only take or catch striped bass um, via methods and gear that are legally allowed. It doesn't specifically say that striped bass must be returned to the water unharmed, and that is part of the um, language in the incidental catch requirement. The PRT doesn't necessarily think that it's um, a compliance issue for these states that have done this, but they just wanted to make sure the board was aware. If the board has any issues, then the PRT can reach back out to those states. But if there is no concern by the board, then we will just note it and then move on from it in the future. And it's really just about whether or not it specifically says striped bass must be returned to the water unharmed. Um, and then lastly, uh, the PRT notes, recommends that uh, New York may want to consider a change to their Hudson River monitoring program to provide an index of relative abundance to characterize the Hudson River stock. And this was a high priority research recommendation of SAW 66, and I think would benefit um, future stock assessments if New York is able to do this. I will take any questions. Thank you, Tony. Questions for Tony on the review? Start with Lauren Lustig. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Tony, for a very, very interesting uh, report. Uh, my question relates to whether the PRT uh, considered uh, the impact of poaching uh, and uh, what sorts of um, uh, totals might be uh, suggested for that illegal activity. Thank you. So I believe Jeff Mercer is on the line, and I know that Emily had a conversation with the law enforcement committee on the ability to um, make any recommendations relative to compliance. And I'm going to see if Jeff can speak to that. I was not a part of that conversation, so it's a little tricky for me to respond. Can you hear me? Yes, Jeff. Yes, yeah, certainly striped bass is a poaching is a big concern. At our last meeting, we discussed um, measures to try to quantify that. Some states do have the ability to pull species specific records out of their records management systems, other states don't. So that's something that uh, we are currently working on to try to quantify uh, the impact of poaching. Lauren, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Jeff. Additional questions for Tony. Adam? Thank you. So as part of the review that was presented here today, you went over the JAI triggers as well. 
was wondering if the PRT has had any discussion about the merits of changed migratory patterns. Uh, clearly, you've seen with the winter tagging study where that's changed location has provided dramatically different results since that location occurred since the years prior to that. So I was wondering if the PRT has begun discussing any similar um, habitat um, changes in climate that are affecting those JAI indices, and if not, what this board could potentially do to seek some answers about that moving forward. The PRT has not, Adam, but we could, TC or? Yeah, I, I think it might be a, a better role for the, the TC um, to, to look at that. I will say, you know, the when they're available in the ocean versus, you know, inshore, offshore, further south, further north, they all still have to go back to the same places to spawn. And so I think these, and these indices are designed to cover, um, the existing spawning grounds so we're and the existing juvenile habitat um so i think you know we could look for you know do we see signals of recruitment outside of these areas in any way um but i think these surveys are designed to try to pick that up and so it's it's not necessarily a matter of these surveys missing them it's more they're probably reflecting potential impacts of climate change on the ability to have a successful year class um, is sort of captured already by those indices um, but we could look into you know look into uh, either for this assessment or for the benchmark assessment um, of looking outside the existing survey areas to try to see if there's if they are in different areas or, or different um, that aren't being picked up by the survey, which I think is maybe your concern. So what would be the appropriate time to make that request? Is that something that would come apart? Well, I assume this board would have to uh, approve TORs at some point for that. Is that where that should come about? Or where would you recommend that request be made in tasking to the TC or other body? Sure. So I think um, I think it depends a little bit on your urgency. I know we are we do have the assessment update next year. Um, I think there is already a lot of work on the stock assessments te team's plate for that assessment update and for any kind of follow up work. Um, so this, depending on how urgent you think it is, it might be better to address that specifically through the benchmark and a term of reference. Um, you, we can make a note that you're interested in this and sort of if time allows prior to that, we can see if we can get something done. However, if you think this is a very high um, issue of concern for you, um, then we can maybe try to prioritize that for this upcoming assessment update. So I would accept a note and I'll continue this discussion with other commissioners and decide how we want to proceed on a more formal basis. Thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. Additional questions for Tony on the plan review? Okay, and, and Tony, do we um, get the necessary clarity or feedback? I guess there were a couple of items that you wanted to be sure of, but I didn't see any opposition. I have the clarity, unless someone raises a concern on the tagging, the PRT will work on that for next year, and I don't think that there was concern on the language, so I think we're good there, so we'll just need to um, have a motion to consider approval of the FMP review and state compliance reports. If somebody wants to make that motion, but there's a yeah. one member of the public. Okay, so we before we take that motion, just because we are going to be approving this document, um, I'm going to. We have one person in the public who has raised his hand, and we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, but to be consistent, I'm going to go ahead and let this one person make comment. Um, or I'm sorry, it's a question. And um, the name of the person is. So, Mr. Temple, um, if you could ask your question and be as concise as possible. Thank you. I apologize. I must have hit that button by accident. No question here. All right. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Um, no other hands raised. I'll entertain a motion. Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll make that motion. The staff have a motion prepared okay i'll make that motion once i have it ready thank you let that get up on the screen first
All right, Emerson, if you could read it in. Move to approve the 2022 fishing year FMP review and state compliance report. Thank you, Emerson. We have a second by John Clark. All right, Emerson, speak to it if need be. It's self-explanatory, maybe. Yeah, I think the, the review that Tony provided um, is self-explanatory. Thank you. All right, John, same. Good. All right. Uh, we'll try it this way. Is there any opposition to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by consent. Thank you. All right. So we're able to move on, and this is where we're going to rearrange things just a little bit. Um, right. So Tony is now going to present the background information on draft addendum two. Following the presentation, we'll take questions on the background section of the draft and only questions on the background of the draft, please. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, today I'll be presenting the Atlantic Strike Bass Draft Addendum 2 um, for board review to take out to public comment. Um, I will go over the background, the timeline, uh, and then we'll take a pause. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I want to thank the plan development team for their time and um, developing this draft document. Um, they had several meetings over the past two months, and these individuals, um, I think, went well above and beyond to get this document ready. So for those supervisors, uh, accolades to your plan review team members, um, they all worked incredibly hard. Um, I will be utilizing some of these plan review or plan development team members today um, in uh, questions potentially, so also thank them ahead of time. I have the phone a friend options. Um, so uh, this is the fastest timeline we can get through for this draft addendum two. Um, currently, we are at the August section um, where the board will consider reviewing this document for public comment. If it is approved, we will have the public comment period August through September. Um, depending on how complex the board makes this document, um, that may extend into October a little. Um, the ideal situation is if we could have it ready for the annual meeting in October, annual meetings a little earlier, so it could be a tight timeline. If we can't make that October timeframe, then we could have a special meeting of the board um, later in the year. Um, depending on um, what types of measures there are, uh, we're hoping that it's somewhat simple and implementation for the states won't be too difficult and that states would be able to implement these measures um, in time for the start of the 2024 fishing year. If the board makes some significant changes to the options in the document, then there's the potential to shift this all back one meeting cycle. Um, so the draft addendum has these four components um, the introduction, the overview, which has the statement of the problem, the background, management status, and fishery status, the proposed management measures, which would include recreational and commercial measures, and then a compliance section. Um, so we'll move into the document now. In May of 23, the board initiated this draft to address stock rebuilding beyond 2023. The board directed the PDT to include measures to achieve an F target um, from the 22 assessment, recreational measures to include modifications to the slot, harvest closures and maximum size limits, commercial measures to include a maximum size limit but no quota reductions, and the ability for the board to respond um, via board action um, to the 2024 stock assessment update. I'll now go into the overview. Um, Atlantic striped bass were declared overfished in 2019 and then thus subject to a rebuilding plan that requires the stock to be rebuilt to its spawning stock biomass by 2029. The most recent rebuilding projections indicate a low probability of meeting that deadline if fishing mortality rates associated with the level of catch in 2022 continues. 
There is concern that the recreational and commercial management measures in Amendment 7, in combination with the strong 2015 year class, um, will lead to similarly high levels of catch in 2024. Therefore, this draft addendum considers measures to reduce removals from the 2022 level to achieve the target fishing mortality rate in 24 and support stock rebuilding. There is also a concern that the addendum process will take too long to respond to the results of the 24 stock assessment update, and therefore the document proposes options to address this. Um, so as I went through in the FMP review, the stock is overfished, but overfishing is not occurring. Uh, the 2022 assessment update um, had projections that indicated we had a 97% probability of achieving a uh, rebuilding goal. Um, that was using the harvest rates from 2021. In May, the board saw that we had new pro uh, projections using the preliminary 22 removals, and that probability dropped to 15%. Um, should be noted that the projections are not the same as a full stock assessment where a model would be rerun to include the 2022 catch at age and index data. Um, we, all right. And this um, uh, figure just shows that probability of achieving stock rebuilding using the 21 data, which is in gray, and then the 2022 harvest data, which is in yellow. So Amendment 7 maintained the, um, the addendum Amendment 6, uh, addendum 6 to Amendment 6, uh, recreational, commercial, and uh, fishery measures. Um, separate management measures are in place for both the ocean and the Chesapeake Bay fisheries due to distinct size availability of fish between these two areas. Because Amendment 7 did not revise the FMP standard commercial and recreational measures from those of Addendum 6, the conservation equivalency programs implemented under Addendum 6 were allowed to be carried forward by the states in 2022 under the framework management of Amendment 7. The use of CE is subject to additional restrictions um, through uh, Amendment 7. Those restrictions do not allow CE programs um, when the stock is overfished. Um, it does have exceptions for the Hudson River, Delaware River, and Delaware Bay fisheries. In context of this draft addendum and the current stock status, um, the FMP standard for the ocean or the Chesapeake Bay recreational fisheries is changed and the existing addendum six conservation equivalency programs affecting those fisheries are invalidated and then a state would not be able to request new CE programs for non quota managed fisheries with the exception of those that I noted until the stock is no longer considered overfished by a future assessment. For the states that combined their um, addendum six conservation equivalency programs across the sectors, so combined the commercial and the recreational measures to get to the 18%, this could have implications beyond just the recreational fishery for those states. Um, part of the rationale for not changing any of the commercial and recreational measures under Amendment 7 was that final action on the amendment was right before we had the stock assessment results. That 2022 stock assessment was expected to provide management advice as whether or not the existing measures under addendum six, under addendum six were successful. And um, did they reduce mortality to the target level and put the stock back on track for rebuilding? The amendment included a provision that would allow the board to immediately respond. Um, the stock assessment results came out somewhat positive, and thus we did not need to utilize the provision. So then um, the board took emergency action. Um, we will get into this a little bit more um, in a couple of minutes, um, but uh, the emergency action um, reduced the ocean recreational slot 
from 28 to less than 35 to 28 to 31. And then it layered a 31 maximum size limit to the bay's recreational fisheries with the exception of the trophy fishery. The measures were intended to reduce harvest from the level seen in 2022 um, to protect that 15 year class. Um, the 15 year class is the primary reason for the increase in harvest in 2022. Um, as many of the fish born that year had begun to exceed the 28 maximum or the 28 inch length, which is the lower bound of the ocean slot. Um, by implementing the 31 inch maximum size, over 50% of the 2015 year class should be, should be protected from recreational harvest. It's projected that the emergency action measures will achieve somewhere between an 18 and 30% reduction in harvest in 2023. Uh, the proposed measures um, could lead to uh, less effort on what anglers prefer is a larger fish in the recreational fishery. This could mean that we could have less harvest or an increase in discards. It makes the short-term um, impacts on the fishery unclear. Uh, if it's uh, one direction, you could have potential short-term impacts on local economies that could be negative if you have less folks going out fishing, if the effort is reduced significantly. But those short-term impacts could be um, stymied by long-term quality fishing experience if they have the positive impact on the stock for rebuilding. Implementing seasonal no harvest closures is intended to reduce the number of fish harvested. However, angler behavior may shift to catch and release fishing, thereby increasing the number of recreational releases. Additionally, seasonal closures for striped bass may shift effort in targeting other species or shift to other times of year when the recreational fishery is open, thus negating some of those um, no targeting or no harvesting closures. In the commercial fishery, looking at social and economic impacts in states where a new maximum size limit significantly changes the size of the commercially harvested fish, dealers, processors, and consumers will have to adjust to a new smaller fish size, potentially requiring changes in the supply chain and marketing. In the short term, harvesters may also be more limited to adjusting to market demand if they're operating within a really small slot. Additionally, the harvest of smaller fish by the commercial sector will likely result in longer effort and an increased number of fish being removed, although the total poundage will not change as that is governed by your state quotas. Looking at the status of the fishery, um, we went over some pieces of this already, um, but uh, so I'm not gonna repeat too much. Uh, in 2022, we saw an increase driven by the rec removals as commercial removals decreased. The commercial sector accounted for 10% of the total removals and the recreational sector accounted for 90% of the total removals. Under the same management measures in 2020 to 2021, total recreational harvest in 2022 increased by 88% relative to 2021. The increase was due to the strong 15 year class. New Jersey landed the largest portion of the recreational harvest, followed by New York, Maryland, and Mass. The proportion of the coastwide um, recreational harvest in numbers from the Chesapeake Bay was estimated at 20% in 2022, um, which is down um, from 35% in 2021. Um, in 2022, the combined private and uh, vessel shore modes of the fishery accounted for 95% of the removals and the for hire was 5%. The ocean and Chesapeake Bay regions experienced different changes in recreational catch in 2022 relative to 2021 um, due to the 2015s coming into that ocean slot. Um, those fish have already moved through the Chesapeake Bay, so it didn't impact the bay catch as much. 
the ocean region saw an increase in the harvest and the bay saw a much smaller increase in recreational harvest and a decrease in live releases. The number of trips directed at striped bass also show a differing trend between the ocean and the bay. In 2022, the ocean directed trips increased by 31% and the bay directed trips decreased by about 2%. I'm almost done. Um, the commercial fishery is managed by a quota system resulting in relatively stable landing since 2004. The ocean commercial size limit seasons and gear types vary by state. The current minimum legal size ranges from 20 to 35 percent. There's a, generally speaking, a lower minimum size in the mid-Atlantic and the New England states have larger minimum sizes and harvest is predominantly hook and line. And in the mid-Atlantic, the harvest is predominantly drift and anchored gill nets. In the ocean region, only New York has a commercial slot with a lower and an upper bound, 26 to 38 at this time. The bay commercial size limits and gear types are more uniform with an 18 inch minimum size for bay states, although Maryland has a year round maximum size limit at 36 inches. PRC and Virginia have seasonal maximum size limits of 36 and 28 inches respectively. All three bay states um, have a combination of pound net, drift net, hook and line gear types. Um, commercial striped bass fisheries operate differently in each state with a wide uh, range of gears and seasons, um, which result in differing size fish being harvested within each state. Mean lengths of harvest range from 30.2 total length to 41.1 total length. And that is the background. Thank you, Tony. And again, thanks to all the PDT members for all their hard work. Um, we'll go ahead and ask, take questions from the board uh, relative to the background material that um, Tony just presented. Mike Luisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and great job, Tony. I know that's challenging to step in uh, on a species like this for staff that that aren't here to uh, to do the presentation. So thanks for doing that. Um, I hope I'm not the only one that may have just gotten a little lost in the discussion on CE. And what would be helpful, <clears throat> I guess, for the follow-up discussion that we plan to have on management options, options is all that you said is there an effect somehow that's going to trickle out into what it is we're discussing now? And if we have to make decisions as a board on how to move forward, given the CE discussion, is that something we should do prior to the management option discussions or, you know, just looking for some direction on making sure that we're all of the understanding as to where any types of changes may stem from? Um, before we get too far into the weeds. Thanks. So if we employ options that are looking at changing the FMP standard, which is pretty much all of the Bay recreational options, to put it bluntly, then you will not be able to use conservation equivalency. You'll have, like whatever gets adopted is what the Bay states would have to employ and CE would no longer be an option because um, of the stock status um, for recreational. Um, if we do not employ changing the FMP standard, which is basically status quo, then you can continue with your currency state regulations, the current state plans. So does that help? And to just to remind everybody, CE is allowed in commercial measures, just to put it out there. <laughs> So given that answer, I just want to make sure I'm clear. We'll have to decide. The board will need to make a decision at some point today how we want past conservation equivalency programs to be factored into where we step off the platform into the future. Is that 
where we are. So to provide an example, there was a few years ago when we made the decision to reduce um, both the commercial and recreational fisheries, we we did it. We we added we put more emphasis on the recreational fishery. We took some quota from the commercial fishery, but it wasn't the same amount in in theory that um, it was it was more lopsided. So for us to continue maintaining the commercial quota we have and if reductions come as a result of addendum two they would come from that quota rather than having to take the 18 percent first and then adding to that reduction that would be if the conservation equivalent if we wipe the slate clean on the states right okay correct if you wipe the slate clean then you'd have to go back Okay. and take the reduction but if you don't wipe the state clean and then the measures that we adopt through the document are the new standard okay then you move forward okay thank you all right thanks mike justin davis thank you mr chair just a clarification on that discussion just then even though so adopting new recreational options in the bay would sort of preclude the use of previously approved CE programs. Some of the measures proposed in addendum two for the Bay include things that were approved by CE. Therefore, you'd sort of be making the stuff that was approved by CE the new FMP standard. So it's not like it would go away. Yeah, they don't necessarily go away as long as they're, but there are options in the document that are being vetted through full public process. So I would not consider them CE measures anymore. Additional questions for Tony. Adam Nowalski. Thank you. Uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, if not, then I'll let you pick the one you want to answer. <laughs> so question number one is that in the section for the statement of the problem, we highlight the concern about the draft addendum needing to consider measures to reduce removals specifically and then later in the document under the emergency action uh, we highlight the fact that that emergency action was meant specifically to reduce harvest uh, so i'm wondering if there was any discussion during the drafting of this document uh, that this section should highlight that most recent action only took action on harvest and not removals which I think given the FMP review that we just received, and if you look in the FMP review, while you highlighted only the last three years, if you look at the last six years, five years preceding 2022, there were more removals that came from release mortality than from harvest. Uh, so I was just, I, my eye caught the fact that the statement of the problem focused on removals, the emergency action harvest and was wondering if there was discussion about building that contradiction out a little bit more in this section and then my second question focused on what i feel is a uh, glaring omission from the social and economic impact impacts of the document regarding the impacts to different demographics uh, specifically the harvest fishermen are typically a very different demographic than your demographic that is targeting releases. And in fact, I think the public comment that we saw, one of them caught my eye here, when you look at a sales manager for Van Stahl, uh, which we know is a very high-end company, advocating for continuing with not affecting the release mortality group. Uh, I think that that makes very clear that there is a very different impact on demographics. So I'm curious as to why that was omitted in entirety in the social and economic impact section. I'm gonna start with your demographic question and then I may um, phone my friends, either Nicola or Nicole, on your first question on relative to it was on purpose to have a distinction between removals and harvest. Um, uh, for the demographics, I need to go and check with our SUS individual who I believe wrote this section. 
my guess is that there isn't hard um, data on the demographics, but I could be wrong. If there is information that we can, you know, somewhat cite from, then we can add that to the document. But if there's not, it's difficult for us to use observed um, information versus information that we can cite. So, right, the question of harvest versus removals. And um, so partly, we're obviously, what the population cares about is removals. It doesn't matter to the striped bass if you get harvested or you died after you were released alive. And so that, you know, the level that we need to get to is based on removals. However, our management tools are not effective at controlling releases. So basically, when you're looking at the... Um, the tools that we have, which is a bag limit or a size limit, we can quantify the impact on harvest better, um, but there we don't really have a way to stop people from releasing so many fish. Um, so the we, we do focus on removals as sort of our overall metric because we are accounting for the fact that if you are, you know, when you make that size limit smaller when you or when you make that slot smaller when you decrease the bag limit you're increasing releases people are throwing more fish back and we're counting those additional dead fishes against the savings and harvest so that we get a um a a total removal that's appropriate so we're not aiming for an x percent redu reduction in harvest we are aiming for an x percent reduction in removals um, which is what we need however the we have a really hard time quantifying metrics or regulations that would get us a reduction in that basically the number of trips that are interacting with striped bass that are releasing striped bass so um the you know you can put in a season and say you this is a closed season, you can't harvest striped bass anymore, or you can't catch striped bass, you can't target striped bass. But we still don't know what the impact of that is going to be on the total number of releases. Is everybody who harvested a striped bass going to switch over to releases? Then you haven't affected your releases at all. Is everybody who fished for or caught a striped bass going to stop fishing for striped bass because it's you're no longer allowed to harvest them, in which case all of your releases would go away. Maybe that's the bottom limit. The, but it's probably somewhere in between where some people will switch to catch and release. Some people will switch to targeting something like bluefish where you're gonna catch striped bass anyway and you're not gonna affect your regulations at all or you're not gonna affect your releases at all even though you are complying with the regulations or you're going to switch to something like black sea bass where you will have a lower release rate of striped bass. So I think the issue that we are struggling with, we struggled with it with this addendum, we struggled with it with the amendment, we've struggled with it for a while now, is what management tools do we have to control the released component of the catch? Um, bag limits and size limits, all of our savings are coming on the harvest side, and that's what we can quantify. It's really hard to quantify the impacts of season closures on circle hooks, on all of these other things, on how we are going to reduce the total number of live releases. Um, so for this addendum, we focused on that harvest component because that's what we could get done in this amount of time. How we handle releases going forward, I think is a much larger conversation. Um, and if the board has thoughts on, on how to handle that, for sure, um, we're open to that. Follow Nick, uh, Adam. So on that thought section, I believe you want to focus just on questions on this right now, and you'll entertain suggestions for edits on the entirety of the document after we get through everything, or are you looking for suggestions to edits to the background section now as well? Just questions now, Adam, if you mind. Additional questions for Tony Emerson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just thought of this as Katie was answering Adam's question. So for no targeting closures, I'm following you, Katie. And I think there's some language to this in the in the um, staff memo. We cannot quantify what the reduction in removals is with things like a no target enclosure. But that doesn't mean there isn't a reduction. It just means that we cannot calculate it. Is that right? 
So, right there, it, maybe there would be a reduction, maybe there would not be. I mean, it's in theory, I think it, it depends on how anglers are responding to that closure. And I think that's what we have always struggled with trying to incorporate into our calculations. So right. is it better than nothing? Um, probably, but is it better than something else? That's where we can't really, that's where we struggle. Right, but we've already, haven't, let me ask the question, haven't we already implemented some um, components where we cannot calculate what the impact is, such as circle hooks and no gaffing, but we've implemented those because we do know that there's going to be a reduction in removals similar to what there might be with a no target enclosure? Thank you. So, yes, we have implemented the circle hook provision, some of the, the gapping requirements, et cetera, that will have a unquantifiable benefit for the stock. Um, but they did not go towards achieving a specific reduction on paper. Um, so essentially they got put in, but we did not count them towards any kind of reduction. And we'll have to wait and see for the benefits kind of in the long term of if they help the stock at all. All right, thanks, Emerson and Katie. All right, so before we move on, any further questions for Tony? This is going to inform our discussions and deliberations regarding the emergency action uh, and our discussions for draft addendum two. Any further questions for Tony? All right, if that's the case, then we'll go ahead and move on. And Tony's now going to provide a summary of the public. I'm sorry, yeah, we're going to move on to the emergency action. Tony will provide a summary of the public hearings on the emergency action. Antonio will also review the timeline for the emergency action, the possibilities for renewal of that action. After uh, this presentation, we'll take questions, and again, only questions on the emergency action for Tony. And after the questions, the board will then need to determine whether or not we're going to renew this action for additional year or not. And I will potentially entertain public comment, depending on the outcome. So Tony, it's all, all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So at our last meeting, the board approved the emergency action to implement the 31 inch maximum size limit for uh, striped bass recreational fisheries, uh, effective for 180, 180 days. Um, it was from May 2nd through October 28th, uh, it expires. Um, the emergency action did exclude the um, Chesapeake Bay trophy fishery. Um, all other measures remain the same. All states implemented the emergency action by the July 2nd deadline. So I'll go through the hearings. We held four virtual public hearings, which is a requirement of emergency action within 30 days of that action. Uh, we had 62 people, including representatives from 11 organizations, comment in support of the emergency action. Those comments noted support for taking proactive, swift action to protect this strong 2015 year class so that those fish can contribute to the spawning stock biomass. biomass I don't know why I can't say that today. Um, and help rebuild the stock. Uh, comments noted the importance of the 2015 year class and the need to get those fish out of the slot limit, especially considering the recent low recruitment that we've been seeing and the lack of strong younger year classes coming into the fishery. Some of the comments noted the importance of all sectors contributing equally to the stock rebuilding and some noted concern about the potential for states to be out of compliance with the emergency action. Uh, we had 24 people, um, primarily charter boat captains, also including representatives from three organizations, comment in opposition to the emergency action. Those comments noted the narrow slot limit would increase recreational releases and mortality due to fishing longer to find a fish within the slot. Comments noted the action only targets those who harvest striped bass and that there should be measures to address the catch and release fishery. Comments noted the negative economic impact of the narrow slot, in particular on the for hire business, and expressed support for managing the for hire sector separately from private boat anglers and shore fishermen. Some noted concern about the accuracy and the use of MRIP data. Some comments also addressed other striped bass management topics, including the need for increased outreach and education on best handling practices. 
um, and release practices and for a better understanding of the contribution of the spawning grounds north of the Chesapeake population, uh, uh, north of the Chesapeake Bay to the population. Um, so as I noted before, the current emergency action expires on October 28th. Uh, if the board deems it is necessary, they can extend this emergency action for one year and they can do this two times. So it would be a total of two years if you did it both times. A simple majority vote is just needed to extend the emergency action. Any questions? Questions for Tony. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I remember correctly, one of the conditions is that the board had to initiate an addendum as part of doing the emergency action. So addendum two, I would assume, meets that standard. And then is there any specification about sort of what we have to do with the addendum during the timeline of the emergency action being in place? You just need to continue to work on the addendum. There isn't a specific timeline in the in the charter to say how quickly the management document needs to be completed. So there's, as long as you're continuing to work on it, it's fine. Additional questions for Tony on the emergency action? All right. Oh, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, this is a simple one. Um, so, thinking about the timing of of how this all plays out, has staff given any thought to whether or not it makes sense to consider that uh, extension today versus in October, when we would be closer to the deadline, kind of giving us an additional year rather than an additional. 10 months to ne till next summer. Boy, I mean, I, we're kind of losing some time. Not that I think the, the emergency is the long-term plan, but as at least for a backstop in the event that addendum two needs some more work and development, has, is there a pro and con versus between August and October since it doesn't um, expire until the end of October? I mean, I, I, we have <clears throat> talked about it um one you know one i think if you're going to extend it you should just use the full provision of the year to allow for that leeway of work on the addendum in case something comes up um the i guess the one may consider a pro of doing it today is that then there is plenty of notice to the public that you're going to extend um uh but I don't, you know, any other pros and cons up to the board, Bob can add to that. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you know, the other way to look at it is if the board were to extend it today, they can make the effective date of that extension October 28th. So you, you wouldn't lose that time, Mike, necessarily. In other words, if, if the board decided to extend it today, the 365 day clock would not necessarily start today. They could have that clock starting in uh, late October. So, you know, and then it provides all the, the advice that Tony gave to the public that the, the board's intention is to carry this emergency forward while they complete the addendum. So it, you don't necessarily lose two months by doing it today, if that's what the board wants to do. That's why you make the big bucks, Bob. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Bob and Tony. Uh, additional questions, Dennis Abbott. And I would assume that if we adopted addendum two, that would supersede the emergency action that we may implement today. Correct. All right, any final questions for Tony before we start our deliberation on the emergency action? Seeing none. Okay, we're gonna open the floor up to the board uh, to, dis to determine, to discuss, and determine whether or not we want to renew this action for another additional year. So I'll start the discussion. Who would like to tee, tee us up? Proponents? Opponents? Go ahead, Dr. Armstrong. I, I think I'm speaking the obvious. I mean, we have to extend this, and so I'll make a motion. All right. 
looks like Madeline and Katie are getting ready. We have a lot of motions back behind the scenes, and so we have to know. this. Well, let me let me talk while you're looking. Um, it would be my intention that this would be added on as Bob just spoke to the end when we run out in October, as opposed to this effective date. It's not in the current motion, but um, if it needs to be added, I'll, I'll do that. So I move to extend the board's May 2nd, 2023 emergency action of 31 inch maximum recreational size limit for another year applicable to all recreational fisheries. And do we want to add a date to that? If Perfect it. Yes, please. Okay. Would you like me to read that again? Yeah, if you I, I can read. Uh, move <laughs> move to extend the board's May 2nd, 2023 emergency action of 31 inches maximum recreational size limit for one year effective October 28th, 2023, applicable to all recreational fisheries. Thank you, Mike. Do we have a second? Dave Sikorsky. Back to you, Dr. Armstrong, for any words to your motion. Um, I don't think I have to say too much. It, it was a necessary thing we had to do. And uh, I think to control F, all indications are that we need to continue it until we have this addendum and then the assessment. All right. Thank you, Mike. And Dave, a seconder, do you want to add anything to the your comments to the motion. No, I, I think it would be important to let the record reflect that this is different than the original emergency action. The original emergency action carved out the Chesapeake Bay Trophy fishery because that fishery was starting or even, even happening for a two-week window earlier this year. But moving forward, as written, that exemption would not exist. It's it. Uh, I don't think Mike intended to revise. Yeah, I have since been informed that we cannot go back and affect the trophy fishery through this motion. So you cannot, and therefore applicable to all recreational fisheries seems to be a little in conflict with that. So and just add, maybe we don't need that last sentence. Edit it to say accept the trophy fishing. The or just after the comma, after 2023, October 28, 2023, comma, just make it a period. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, just a quick comment on this. You know, procedurally, the charter only allows the board to extend an emergency action for these two one-year periods. It doesn't allow an extension and a modification at the same time. So if the board wanted to do a new emergency or something different, it would, you know, trigger two thirds vote. And this motion only needs to be passed by simple majority and it would trigger the four public hearings, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's, you know, one year extension of the current emergency provision, then, you know, then you don't need any of those, just simple majority, no public hearings. All right, thank you, Bob, for that clarification. And um, so we have the motion now refined appropriately. All right, Roy Miller. Mr. Chairman, could I seek clarification? The motion as it now reads and as interpreted by um, Bob Beal, that means we are not changing, not requiring uh, a change to the Bay Trophy fishery. Am I right? That is correct. Okay. All right, other, other discussion on this motion? I would offer that this motion should include explicit language that this emergency action would terminate with the implementation of draft addendum two. Uh, I would accept that as something if we just want to add that as a friendly amendment, or if not, I'll make that motion to amend this. Go ahead, Bob. 
I think this can be done two different ways, either the way Adam suggested or in the text of the addendum as it's going, you know, say the intent of this addendum is to replace the emergency action that's currently in place at the commission. So I think it needs to be clear that that's the intent, but it can be done either way, I think it is fair. Dr. Armstrong, would you accept a friendly? I would. All right, can we modify then? And Mike, I've got you in the queue next, right? You would raise your hand. All right, go ahead, Mike. In the interest of time, let's go ahead and keep the conversation going. Yeah, certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I guess my question is, why don't we just put up what the emergency rate, what the emergency action was and extend it instead of the debate and discussion about the language? And to make sure it's clear, to the public, doesn't it make sense just to move it forward? I don't know, just a, just a thought. Go ahead, Tony. The meeting summary, I can make, I can put the motion in if that's helpful, Mike. I don't think we have to repeat the motion, but I'll make sure it's very clear what the measures were, promise. All right, so we're still modifying that motion. Uh, further discussion? Yeah, okay. okay. So we're good now? All right, modification complete. Adam? Thank you. So while I appreciate this change, uh, this really doesn't change my position from where we were when we discussed this back at the spring meeting, namely that if the concern of this body is the health of the resource, and in five of the last six years, removals have exceeded, uh, the majority of the removals have come from release mortality and not harvest, and this emergency action focuses only on harvest, how can we in good conscience say we're doing this purely for the resource? We are doing this as a de facto reallocation from the harvest fishery to the release fishery. The reallocation of such has a dramatic impact on the demographics of the users of this resource. They are very different users. They come from very different backgrounds. They have a very different purpose. Not only is this not in the overall best interest of the resource, but it severely impacts one demographic group over another. And so I continue to remain in opposition to this on those merits, not because I'm turning a blind eye to the health of the resource. Thank you, Adam. Um, additional comments, particularly if anybody hasn't had a chance to, to to weigh in. And I think we may, before we call the question, we may have some public that want to comment. Is that correct, Tony? Uh, Julie Evans had her hand up. I'm trying to find her hand again. There we go. All right, Julie, I've opened up your mic. Um, thank you, Tony, and thank everybody here today for their comments. I am uh, su in support of Adam's comments. I find them um, right on target. Um, uh, and um, as a as a fairly new person to these sorts of meetings, even though I've only done it for three or four years, it is is kind of perplexing to me why one segment, one one group, is giving priority to continue to catch trophy fish over the rest of us. Maybe, you know, I know you're not talking about this, but sometime during this meeting, maybe somebody can explain to me why the Chesapeake Bay Trophy Group is able to go unfettered um, while everyone else has to um, toe the line on, you know, slot size. But, um, you know, just to this, speaking to this, and that was a question like, you know, 10 minutes ago, but you know, I, I find Adam's comments on target and I would support Adam 
its targets. And by the way, I am the fisheries uh, representative for the town of East Hampton, although we couldn't reach our own consensus on what I should say today. So I am speaking on behalf of our local for hire industry here in Montauk, which continues to suffer tremendously because of what is going on in their striped bass fishery. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take up to three more comments, one minute a piece. And we have Ms. Evans commented for about one minute. So we'll take three more, up to three more comments, one minute a piece. I'm gonna look into the room for now. Is there anybody in the room that would like to comment? We'll go back to online. And online, Tom Fody. Tom. Tom, you just need to unmute yourself. Tom, you're still self-muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, Tom, you can. I strongly agree with Adam. I mean, I just find it disingenuous that Maryland makes the motion while you get exempted for the trophy fishery. And I also see that Massachusetts allows for hook and line commercial fishery, which is, which I don't know how they regulate it, but from what I understand, any recreational person that decides to go into the commercial fishery can get a permit. And this way, if you sell seven fish, you can actually take one home to eat so they get around the regulation. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what I've heard. I find this regulation it totally affecting the subsistence fishermen. It's environmental justice. We keep talking about environmental justice at NOAA. I do it at Mayfac, and I find the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission ignores it completely, even though when I was a commissioner, I brought it up numerous times, and you basically seem to not care what happens to the poor or the subsistence fishermen. And they are a majority, or they're a lot more popular in numbers than the, uh, the hook and release fishermen. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the time. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And we'll take up to two more comments. Do we have anybody else, Tony? No hands on the webinar. All right, is there a need to caucus before the vote? And again, this takes a simple majority, I believe. No need to caucus. Um, we'll go ahead and can we, do we need to take a... No. So, so we are going to uh, call these into the record, but we'll start off with uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Let's start from my right side. New Hampshire, Maine, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. All those opposed, please raise your hand. District of Columbia and New Jersey. Oh, no. That is everybody, right? Okay. Motion passes, 14 in favor, two opposed. Thank you. All right, next we'll go to back to draft addendum, back, back to the draft addendum. Um, yeah, let's do that actually. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break um, and then just kind of re we'll reconvene here in five minutes, let everybody get just catch their breath for a second, because I think this next step of the discussion is going to be pretty lengthy, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll have we'll be ready to go. <laughs> hopefully we won't need multiple five minute breaks. But take five minutes. Be back at three o one. All right, thank you everyone. The ASMFC Atlantic Stripe Bass Board is reconvened. And so now Tony will continue presenting 
the draft addendum, and we'll go into the proposed management options. Following the presentation, we'll take questions first, again, only questions, and after the questions, we'll move into discussion. We can have a brief discussion, but if there are motions, we're gonna to want to get those onto the table as soon as possible. Um, so, Tony, go ahead, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, I neglected to also thank the technical committee for their work in helping the plan development team craft um, these options or um, develop analyses to support these options. So I also just want to say thank you to them as well. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance about how much I'm going to speak now um, to provide clarity for how the PDT came about some of these options and the rationale behind them. Um, as uh, I think someone noted earlier, there is a side document, a PDT memo that gets into some of the issues and concerns that the PT, PDT saw. Um, the PDT made some recommendations that the board so in some cases, they're recommendations, in some cases, they're observations for additional options that the board could add to the document if it's the board's prerogative. Um, we would need some uh, motions to add those things specifically to the document. We tried to craft um, uh, the options in the PDT memo to read as they would if you added them into the document to make it easier to, to add in quickly. Um, but I have built those into the presentation today. I won't do a separate um, PDT memo presentation. So, um, in order to develop the management options, we needed to do uh, projections. Uh, a projection method was used in the 2022 assessment to figure out um, to achieve the F target in 24 with a 50% probability. Uh, the TC used the 2022 removals um, and state, state removals and estimated 23 removals to account for uh, the emergency action regulations. A new selectivity curve was developed for the 23 emergency action regulations. Um, these we also the TC also did some sensitivity runs and um, for for these projections and found that the 23 removals varied anywhere between 4.8 and 5.7 million fish. Um, the necessary percent reduction to achieve the F target in 24. Um, only varied by 1.5%. So while that seems like a large variation in um, millions of fish, the actual percent is not quite as large. Um, so uh, these projections concluded that we needed a 14.5% reduction to achieve the F target in 2024. Um, there, because of the maximum size limit um, is being considered and not uh, reductions in quota, uh, we cannot um, determine what that reduction is unless we do um, some runs to determine what those calculations would be to adjust the quotas. So you would have to um, do some additional work to figure out how much of a reduction you get from the uh, maximum size limits. Those runs have to be for each individual state because each state's um, selectivity is different with their maximum size limits. We did not have time to do that for this. And so the PDT determined that commercial reductions um, cannot be calculated for the maximum size limit. So the overall reduction has to come straight from the recreational fishery. And that overall reduction would be 16.1%. Um, in order to figure out the option development, the TC um, did a bunch of work to calculate what were the best years um, to use in order to characterize fish availability in 2024, because we have to project that um, on using something other than a stock assessment. The TC determined for the ocean fishery, um, 2020 data is used to 
characterize the fish availability in 2024, and 2022 data was used to develop the closure options. For the bay, they used 21 data to characterize fish availability in 24, and 2022 data for um, the closure options. So getting into the recreational options first, um, the recreational options presented are designed to achieve a 16.1% reduction in the ocean and at least a 16.1% reduction in the bay. All size limits are in total length, bag limits are per person per day, um, and the board will choose one option for each region when they approve the document. Um, conservation equivalency programs will not be allowed for non-quota managed recreational fisheries with the exceptions of the Hudson River, Delaware River, Delaware Bay recreational fisheries. Um, it's noted that in uh, the CE criteria for proposals, um, it says that you should have no less than a two week duration of closure. Uh, this document does have some closures that are 10 days. Uh, the TC and PDT determined that if you do do a 10 day closure, then there has to be two consecutive weekends um, from a Friday to a Sunday bounding that 10 day closure. Um, so for the ocean recreational fishery, we have two options, well, <laughs> two sort of two options. Uh, you have option one, which is status quo. You have one fish um, at 28 to less than 35 inches um, with the 2017 um, season dates. Um, this allows for the continuation of existing Addendum 6 conservation equivalency plans, and it does not achieve the objective of the document to achieve the F target in 24. So then we have a series of different um, uh, size slot limits and season, season closures. Um, the season closures are no harvest closures. Um, most of the ocean slot options continue the use of the 28 minimum size limit given the longstanding nature of this measure and consideration of environmental justice issues. So for example, providing legal access to shore-based anglers um, to continue providing some protection to that strong 2015 year class um, and that none of the ocean slot limits exceed a 34 inch maximum size. For the season closures, a coastwide closure with the same closure dates for each state would ensure consistency in the timing of closures across all states, but would present an equability challenge. Uh, we know that recreational fisheries operate very differently along the Atlantic coast. Um, based on timing, other biological, environmental, and social economic considerations. So coastwide, coastwide closures would result in a different level of harvest reduction for each state. 2022 harvest data by way were used to calculate what level of harvest reduction would be expected for the seasonal closure options that I'll present here. Um, and if these tables are too small. I'm sorry, you can follow along in your addendum document to see the measures better. Um, but the first set of options look at the 28 to 31 slot limit. Um, and it has various closures from 10 to 21 days and in different waves. The next set of options, which are C, have uh, slot limits at uh, 28 to 32 inches with closures 14 to 21 days. And then option D has a slot limit of 30 to 33 inches with closures from um, 14 to 21 days. For the bay, um, again, we have status quo, one fish at 18, 2017 season dates, allows for the continuation of the CE programs from addendum six, and this option does not achieve the objective of the document. Um, all Bay options propose a maximum recreational size limit um, for B through I. These range from 23 to 28 inches. The higher maximum size limit of 28 inches allows for a harvest of a proportion of the above average 2018 year class 
which will be age six with an average length estimate of just over 26 inches in 2024. We see differences in striped bass seasons um, and they have long differed between the bay jurisdictions. In 2020, those seasons were further deviated with additional CE plans in the bay. Um, so due to the complexity of the addendum six CE plans and associated uncertainty estimated in estimating increased harvest from removing a closure, all the options that are presented maintain those 2022 season closures. It should be noted that recreational closures implemented in some of the Bay jurisdictions were a part of approved CE plans to account for taking a lower reduction in the commercial sector to overall achieve the previous Addendum 6 reduction. By maintaining the shorter 2022 recreational seasons, those previous CE programs cannot be entirely wiped clean. So that may be considered when addressing the starting point for the commercial quotas. And this gets at your question, Mike, of either wiping the slate clean or just starting a new FMP standard. Um, some of the option proposes additional closures on top of the existing closures. Those additional seasonal closures proposed in the options are no harvest closures, and the additional closures continue when current harvest occurs throughout the year in each bay jurisdiction. Um, so the options B and C are, um, can they, the consistency in these options is um, a maximum size limit. It is uh, 23 inches for B and option C is 24 inches. Then options D, E, F, and G have consistent minimum and maximum size limits. They range um, from 20 to 24, 20 to 25, 20 to 26, and then 20 to 28. And then the options H and I have consistent minimum size, maximum size, and bag limits. And those bag limits are all set at one fish. So the PDT notes on the recreational options. Um, the, the board would want to consider a starting point for the measures. Um, this mostly just applies to uh, the Bay options and the commercial options due to the nature of the CE programs in place. Are we wiping the slate clean? Or are we starting a new FMP standard? No recreational or no Bay recreational option creates a truly consistent set of measures across the Bay. This is due to those issues that I just raised um, with the, the season closures. So wiping the slate clean was not 100% feasible with these options, um, but the PDT did try to create options where there are standard size bag limits with um, the 2022 seasons maintained. Uh, if it's the board's intent to proceed in adopting past CE programs as part of the new FMP standard or not, the board can eliminate options before approving the draft addendum for public comment. So if you want to wipe the um, slate clean, you can, and we'll pull those options out. Um, or if you don't, you don't have to. Some of them would eliminate certain commercial options as well. For the Bay, since the rec options don't completely wipe the slate clean, the commercial FMP standard approach may not be consistent across the board. And for the ocean, the board should consider the implications of the FMP standard on states that originally took less than an 18% quota reduction for their commercial fisheries in addendum six. And I'll note that the board doesn't have to make these decisions today outside of whether or not you're gonna remove some options or not. Um, you can you know, make a final judgment call of whether or not you're saying something's gonna become the new FMP standard when you approve the final options in the document. Um, so the PDT had some additional notes on recreational options that you could in also include. Um, these are mode splits, no targeting seasonal closures, and at sea filling. Uh, so uh, I know there's a lot of words on the screen. Um, this shows the actual options as they would read if we added them into the document. Um, 
But more importantly, uh, the board discussed potential exemptions for for higher modes from the 2023 emergency action um, due to the lateness of the rule change. But that motion failed due to lack of majority. During that discussion, some board members noted they have overarching concerns about considering separate for hire measures as a part of the straight bass FMP at all. The PDT acknowledged the comments made by the board, but they also recognized the public comment that they heard when listening to the emergency action um, public hearings. So considering the comments that they heard, they went ahead and explored potential recreational options with differing bag limits or, seas or slot limits for private vessel shore anglers and for the four higher modes. The PDT recognizes that there are several issues that the board would need to consider, including concerns about equity and enforcement on different regulations and develop possible options to not delay the addendum schedule, should it be the board's desire to consider a recreational mode split. Um, for the ocean recreational measures, potential options propose a wider slot limit in the four higher modes for some of the draft addendum options. Mathematically, a wider slot limit in the for hire sector are feasible in the ocean because their for hire removal, removals are a small proportion of the total ocean removals. On average, it's 6% of the ocean recreational harvest and 3% of the total ocean recreational removals over the past three years. And therefore, it doesn't impact each option's achievement of the overall reduction much. The ocean recreational mode split options um, on the screen allow the four higher modes to harvest a wider slot, only decreases each option's reduction by 0.1% compared to it if the four higher modes were under the same measures as the rest of the fishery. For the bay, uh, potential options could propose an increased bag limit of two fish for the four higher modes across all the bay jurisdictions instead of one fish. In the bay, the for hire removals are about one fifth of the total bay removals. So on average, 27% of the bay recreational harvest and 18% of the bay recreational removals over the past three years. So to account for the two fish bag limit, some of the mode split options propose a narrower slot limit as compared to the existing options where it has a one fish bag limit. Uh, for uh, addition, another additional option could be at sea filleting. Uh, during the recreational size limit options, a PDT member raised concerns about state allowances for at sea filleting of recreational caught striped bass, in particular where racks are not required um, for enforcement of size limits and there are no corresponding minimum maximum fillet lengths. Um, so with the expected narrowing of legal size fish, there could be an incentive to exploit this loophole in the states that do not have these measures already in place. Um, enforcement with maximum size limits is particularly challenging when you do allow for um, at sea filleting. So the option uh, allows for states to craft their own measures, but address specific issues um, to narrow the exploitation of loopholes. All right, I am missing my no target, no targeting seasonal closure slide, so I'm just gonna talk about it. Um, the PDT also, uh, made notes about no targeting season closures. Um, while the board did have discussions during the emergency action regulations about the potential of addressing no targeting closures, they did not implement those because um, as we previously discussed through Adam's question, we don't have an ability to quantify um, these measures. The board could take any of the no harvest closures and turn them into no targeting closures. Um, some of this was raised during the public hearing comments um, as the same concerns that both Adam and Tom brought up today, uh, but we would not be able to quantify what additional 
um, reduction may come from a no targeting closure versus a no harvest closure. The law enforcement committee has in the past said that they do have difficulties um, enforcing no targeting closures um, due to the nature of the inability to confirm that someone is directing on striped bass versus another fishery. I recognize that there are some states and jurisdictions that have been trying this. Um, and so if we do move forward with this, we could talk with their law enforcement on how successful or unsuccessful they have been in the enforcement of the measure. Okay, then I will move on to commercial measures, which is slide 31, thanks. All right. So the following options propose implementing a maximum size limit for the striped bass commercial fisheries in the ocean and the Chesapeake Bay. The intent of the size limit options is to protect the largest mature female striped bass contributing to the SSB. Commercial striped bass fisheries operate in each state with varying gears, seasons, and size limits. Consequently, the implementing a standard maximum size limit across all commercial striped bass fisheries would result in a range of impacts that differ by state and gear type. In the past, when individual states changed their commercial size limits through CE, the states simultaneously adjusted their quotas up or down for maintaining the same spawning potential under the new size limits as compared to their previous size limit. The process of adjusting quotas to maintain the same spawning potential has been standard practice for CE programs in the FMP for many years. If a commercial maximum size limit is implemented and there are corresponding quota adjustments to account for spawning potential, many state quotas will likely decrease to account for lost spawning potential due to harvesting smaller fish. As maximum size limits decrease, um, harvested fish size will also decrease along with the degree of corresponding commercial quota reductions as illustrated in this table. Additionally, a new maximum size limit may lead to states requiring a lower minimum size limit through conservation equivalency to expand their harvest slot. This would further contribute to changes in quotas and changes in the size of the commercially harvested fish. States that already have smaller fish would likely see less of a quota reduction from a new maximum size limit since their fisheries already select for a smaller fish. If a commercial maximum size limit is implemented without corresponding quota adjustments, the number of fish harvested may increase since the average size of the commercial harvested fish may decrease in some states along with the potential of increased discards, which would be the opposite effect of what you would be trying to do through these addendum measures. If the maximum size limit is implemented, there's also significant concern about the potential for increased dead discards from anchored gill nets. The concern is any intended benefit of releasing the larger striped bass caught in the anchored gill nets will be offset by the high mortality rate of discarded fish from these gill nets and the resulting need to continue fishing possibly with a greater amount of gear in order to meet that um, individual's quota or the state quota. So for the options, um, there is status quo, no change in the maximum size limit, maintain all um, measures and quotas from uh, 2017 or the addendum 6 CE plans, the Amendment 7 quotas, including CE adjusted quotas, would also remain unchanged. And then we have a series of potential um, options. The first option set for B is um, adjustments to the spawning potential with the quota. Um, option B1 is no adjustment. The quotas would not be adjusted with a spawning potential analysis. It would not account for a change in the spawning potential resulting from harvesting different size fish. Option B2 is um, you would uh, adjust the quotas. They would be adjusted with a spawning potential analysis. 
um, state specific analyses would be required in order to adjust the spawning potential for the new size limit and then most state quotas would likely decrease. Option set C is um, what is the starting point for applying maximum size limits to quotas. Uh, C1, you would use 2022 as the starting point. So all of the um, measures and quota limits from, to, from this 2022 year, those include those that have been adjusted for Addendum 6 CE. Uh, the states could still submit conservation equivalency proposals to adjust their size limits um, using spawning potential analyses. Um, but in this measure, the states could not go below 18 inches and, um, and they could not go above whatever is the selected maximum size limit. And then for um, option C2, you would use the FMP standard as the starting point. So we would align the quotas with the historical FMP standard. So go back um, and then implement selected maximum size limits from those original quotas prior to um, it's Amendment 6. And um, they would result in a standard commercial slot limit for, for each reason, each region. Um, oh, there's my no targeting slide. It got mixed up. We'll skip that one. <laughs> uh, for option set D, the ocean commercial maximum size limits, we have a series of size limits. They range from 38 to 42 um, for the ocean fishery. And then option set E looks at maximum size limits for the Chesapeake Bay. They range, um, it is 36 inches for all um, bay commercial fisheries, except for January 1 through May 31st, when the max size would be reduced to 28 inches, or uh, there's a second option that does not have that season um, put in. So the PDT notes um, that if a spawning potential analysis and quota adjustment, adjustment is required as part of this addendum. I think those are option, uh, the B set options. Um, this will be unique for each state and will need to be conducted at some point. The board has to decide if they choose to utilize these options when this analysis would occur. I have three choices. Um, one, before public comment occurs, so that would delay the addendum by one meeting cycle. The benefit of this is that during public comment, they would be able to see what happens to their commercial quota, whether or not it goes up or down. It can be done after the addendum is approved. Um, and the public would not know how their quota would change during the comment period. Or option three, which is in the middle of the public comment period, um, and states would, work to try to figure out how their quota would be adjusted, um, hopefully prior to their public hearing, so it could be a part of your public hearing. I have some concerns about this third option if it is asking for commission staff to be a part of this figuring out of how the adjustment would be. We're on a um, reduced staff <laughs> capacity. Um, not having Emily in house and work being done on the 2024 stock assessment and many other stock assessments that are ongoing right now. So if the states can support this reduction on their or determining um, what the spawning potential analysis will show to how it impacts the quota on their own, then we could do this. But if it's asking commission staff to do this, it will be very difficult to do so. Um, so thinking about the commercial size limit changes and quota discussions, uh, quota adjustments, um, past changes to commercial sizes have been accompanied by these corresponding changes to the state's commercial quota to account for maintaining that spawning potential. 
Um, this process has been a standard practice for many years. So the PDT recommends that the board discuss their intent and make a decision today regarding how to move forward with this. Um, and if they do not want to adjust, then you can eliminate several of the management options. Lastly, um, the PDT discussed, as I noted, in the presentation um, anchored gill nets. Um, there were concerns about the potential for the increased dead discards, um, particularly for the anchored gill nets by the PDT if a maximum size limit is implemented. The concern is, and you know, relative to the intended benefit being negated by the rate of discards. It's estimated that a 45% discard mortality rate is um, seen in the anchored gill nets. This is what's being used in the stock assessment. Um, so to address the concern, the draft addendum could consider provisions specific to anchored gill nets that would implement a maximum mesh size instead of a maximum fish size. Uh, determining what that maximum mesh size may need to be could take some time. So the board could include options that would say that the mesh size would be specified at a later date, um, which may be difficult for the public to comment on. Or states could submit conservation equivalency programs for those that have anchored gillnet programs. Um, and then lastly, um, during the discussions, there was a concern raised about the commercial tagging programs on the point of tagging um, and that uh, tagging of striped bass at the point of sale versus the point of harvest. Three states um, tag at the point of sale. One PDT member noted that point of sale tagging may not be as effective from an accountability and enforcement perspective as compared to point of harvest tagging, especially if states have overlapping commercial and recreational size limits. There is a difference of opinion on, among the PDT members on this issue. Another PDT member noted that point of harvest tagging has the same potential accountability and enforcement issues and that states with point of sale tagging have effectively addressed overlapping sector size limits by requiring recreational thin clipping provisions. If the board is concerned with this at all, they could um, either ask for this review of the commercial tagging program, which we said we would do earlier um, in the FMP review, um, and then uh, the results of the PRT's findings could be included in another management document, or the board could just make a decision and include it in this document. And then the last section of the document looks at um, responding to the stock assessment. Uh, in the last, in Amendment 7, we had a similar provision that was not needed, but this provision says, if an upcoming stock assessment update indicates that the stock is not projected to rebuild by 2029 with a probability of greater than or equal to 50%, the board could respond via board action um, where they could change management measures um, by voting just to pass a motion at the board meeting instead of developing an addendum. This allows for fast um, action to the stock assessment. Uh, if an, an addendum or an amendment process is in, done instead, it can take up to two years for those measures to be implemented versus board action often allows that those actions to be Im implemented in the next fishing year or even immediately if it's something that can be changed um, by the states through emergency action. So today we are looking to consider approval of this document for public comment. I will take questions. Thank you, Tony, for the very thorough presentation. And here we go. So we'll start off uh, with questions only. After questions are done, we'll prepare for the discussion. And let's start, see if we can pick a few hands we haven't called on yet. So start with Doug Grout. Keep your hand raised if so I can get you in queue. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the PDT for all their tremendous work with this and coming up with a number of options that can address our issues here. I had, Tony, three um, questions uh, for clarification uh, for me. Um, the first one is I noticed under the um, Chesapeake Bay recreational options on your slide up there, you had a note at the beginning that said, does not achieve needed percentage reduction. Is that anywhere in the, uh, identified anywhere in the, in the uh, document? Uh, and it, if it is, just point me to the page and that's fine. I just was looking at that. That surprised me because I didn't see that any place. And then I'll have two more once you're through with that. So for it's option A status quo for both the ocean and the bay options don't achieve the okay. measures and it is on page 13 and 15 as part of the text of the status quo option. Okay, thanks. Um, it says it doesn't achieve the objective which is of the document uh, which is the reduction. I mean okay. and the objective is the reduction so. Okay thank you I appreciate that. Um, and this next question uh, involves um, uh, the conservation of equivalency provision. And um, I, it, it, there is an exemption that, um, you know, it says uh, you can't have conservation equivalency uh, if you don't have quota. I mean, if you don't have quota management, except for Hudson River, Delaware River, and Delaware Bay, they get an exemption for that. Is there somewhere in the document that explains why that is uh, because I can imagine the uh, public asking that question. So it's not in this document because it was part of what was decided under Amendment 7. So um, it may be in there, it may not be, it, but it's basically related to the availability of the size of the fish available in these more producer areas. So Chesapeake Bay is essentially grandfathered in with having smaller size limits, whereas the Delaware Bay and the Hudson River are not um, under our current system. And the, so conservation equivalency is a way for them to, uh, I think the board wanted to retain that ability to, to adjust, have smaller size limits yeah. for these producer areas that are not officially producer areas but that was part of amendment seven okay part of amendment seven and, and and i would suggest be prepared at public hearings for for that question uh to be explained to the public and finally um under the commercial uh let's see uh if i can read my scratch here <laughs> um i have a question if i, I know the board in their motion uh, for the addendum um, said to uh, produce a document with re uh, reducing the maximum size limit and not uh, reducing the quota. If, if we were to try to add that in right now, um, would we, you wouldn't need a, a calculation of SPR reductions, would we? If you just want to do straight reduction of the quotas. Straight reductions of the quotas of 14%. Correct. No SPR calculations, but the SPR calculations are only related to the size limit changes in the commercial fishery. So no size limit changes, no SPR calculations. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So the queue is John Clark, and then we'll go to Emerson Hasbrook, Justin Davis, and Max Appleman. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Roy just said that you missed him, so. It's okay. It's okay. I won't ever let that happen again. <laughs> and thank you, Tony, for that whirlwind tour through a long and complicated document here. But um, if I missed it, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of curious because I know the motion said that for recreational options that seasonal closure should be a secondary um, option for those. And yet I take it we can't meet these reductions without them. Uh, Katie's just given us, you know, another reminder of how 
impossible it is to quantify these seasonal reductions. So, um, I, like I said, I'm just curious, was there any other possibilities? Like, I mean, obviously, a 28 to 28 and a half inch slot is impossible, but like a small slot and then like maybe a fish over 45 inches, which would, I, I don't, I'm just asking if there are ways to do this without coming up with these uh, seasons. So, yeah, the, I mean, the basically the emergency action 28 to 31 inches alone got you extremely close to that reduction, but on paper did not achieve that reduction. So on paper to get to get to that 16 percent reduction, we would need or to get to the required reduction, we would need a um, either an even narrower slot. And I think that the PDT did talk about, you know, would we want to go to a half inch, uh, you know, like. 28 to 20 to 30.5 and they agreed that we don't manage on a half inch slot on a half inch measurement right now that would just be incredibly confusing for everybody and probably really difficult to quantify like the savings in that half inch um so i think you know you'd have to go to either a narrower slot um or add these season closures in obviously you know the season closures are only giving us a few extra percentage points on paper um so which is probably within kind of the uncertainty about some of these reductions anyway but essentially on paper there was no way to get to the reductions we needed without um these season closures but just to be clear, you said that 28 to, I'm ju just curious, so 30 and a half would get the reduction? Or so we did not look at any for the ocean. We looked at a couple for the bay where the, where like going to, going half an inch down would get you to, you know, would, or half an inch up would get you to that right reduction. We didn't really look at it for the bay, it, or sorry, for the ocean. It's possible on paper you could try to track that down, but we felt like the enforcement and management uncertainty around that was not worth it. Thank you, John. Roy, I'm gonna make amends with you. You get the next shot. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Tony, for your summarization of this considerable body of work by the plan development team. A lot of thought went into it. Um, during, the, during your summary of this process, I lost track of Chesapeake trophy fishery um, where does it fit into all of this or is would there no longer be a chesapeake trophy fishery Thank the you. trophy fishery would have to follow all of whatever the ocean fishery um, measures are because that is how that um, trophy fishery exists it's based off of the ocean fish so it would have to follow those measures so they might need to rename the program if if we went to a a fairly low maximum size limit that's no longer a trophy fish then perhaps thank you roy so back to the queue we'll go emerson justin and max thank you mr chairman um i didn't have a specific question for tony on her presentation my question is more about process in terms of how we're going to move forward. So I can either ask you that question right now, Mr. Chairman, or you can come back to me um, when when you've gone through other people who have direct questions for Tony. It's your pleasure. I'm sorry, Emerson. I got distracted for a second. Just can you? Sure. Go ahead. Emerson, for process, I think what Marty would like to do, or he and I have discussed, is um, we can we'll go through each of the um, sectors. So we'll start with, well, it's a pleasure of the board where you wanna start, but we can start with recreational or commercial or the um, response, but we'll do all of the recreational at once, all of the commercial at once, and then um, the response one, if that helps. Thanks, Emerson. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a question related to the spawning or the potential to do a spawning potential analysis um, related to the maximum size limit options so there was a slide in the presentations that, that said it was a possibility that if we kicked it back one meeting cycle sent it back to the pdt we could ask for that spawning potential analysis 
if I'm understanding it right, the outcome of that analysis would be dependent on the options selected in option sets B, C, D, and E, or actually just be C, D, and E, right? So, you know, you need to figure out whether you're using the FMP standard as the starting point or 2022, and then, you know, which max size limit for the ocean or the Chesapeake Bay accordingly. So, you know, with the intent, no, it's possible the board could make a decision at this meeting to eliminate option set C and just make a decision there. But either way, you're talking about sort of multiple permutations. And so the intent would be to produce that. I guess I'm just asking, like, is it feasible to really do all that before the next meeting? We would shoot for that, Justin. If there is no eliminations of any of the option sets, it might be real tricky. I was really hoping that we would choose either wipe the slate clean or FMP standard so that it doesn't have to be so many permutations um, and maybe, you know, knock one or two options out of those permutations. But pleasure of the board, if we leave them all in, I make no promises. And Max. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Tony. I think uh, a question for Katie, maybe. I'm just trying to reconcile two different um, numbers that I've seen in the draft addendum versus an earlier, I think it was a TC report. Um, on the one hand, we're saying 14.5% reduction relative to 2022 to get us to F target in 2024. And then I think I saw in another, and this was based on the emergency measures, achieving a, up to a 30% reduction relative to 2022. But I, this is getting back to what John was saying. We don't see that as like a standalone option uh, in the draft addendum. So I, I think my brain is trying to do an apples to apples comparison where there isn't one. And maybe you can just help me understand the differences in those, those two numbers. Right. So... I think this really illustrates kind of where we are, you know, sort of we've reached a lot of the of what we can do with the limits of the data that we have and the assumptions that we can make about what kind of a reduction we can expect. So the um, there were sort of two questions here, two steps to this calculation. The first step is, number one, we've implemented emergency action in 2023 what is that going to do to removals in 2023? So, and then we need that in order to take the next step to project forward to say, okay, we expect this level of removals in 2023, what level of removals can we get or in 2024 and be at or below the F target? And so then you, you figure out that, so that gives you sort of a, you know, this is the level of removals we need in 2024, according to the projections, and that is, basically a 14.5% reduction from 2022 levels. Um, and so the in order to achieve that F target in 2024, and then we have to go back and say, okay, what combination of regulations will on paper get us to that reduction? Um, and so for the question of what does emergency action do, we basically used um, 2018 and 2019 as proxies for what we think is going to happen in 2022 and 2023 because the age, uh, sorry, the 2011 year class is basically the same age in 2018 and 2019 as the 2015 year class will be in 2022 and 2023. So we could sort of use what happened to the 2020, uh, 2011 year class as it moved from 2018 to 2019 um under you know consistent regulations what happened to that let's apply the emergency action regulations to 2019 and see what kind of reduction you get and that gives us that big reduction of 30 percent and that's a lot of that is coming from the fact that we saw a drop in catch mainly in the bay as we moved from 2018 to 2019 with no change in regulations so that calculation is combining the effects of the new regulations, that is that tighter slot limit, as well as the effects of fish availability and the growth of that 2011 year class into and out of that slot. And so that's where our, our big 30% number comes from. However, there's a lot of different assumptions we can make about how to do that calculation on paper. For example, a lot of that catch, there was almost no effect of the emergency action on paper on the bay 
but you still see a big drop in catch from 2018 to 2019 in the Bay. If we assume 2022 to 2023, there is no change in the Bay harvest, you get a smaller reduction. Um, if we only look at the effect of what happens if we implement those measures on 2019 relative to 2019, as opposed to relative to 2018, you get an even smaller reduction. That's down to about, um, I think that's like maybe 16 or 18 percent compared to that 30 percent. So I think that illustrates the uncertainty in these reductions and what we're trying to capture with these reductions on paper of the dynamics of changes in effort, changes in angler behavior, changes in the availability and the abundance of the fish, the growth of the fish. Um, and then so we get to 2024 and we're trying to do these calculations again on paper. This time, ideally, it would be great if we could say what happened in 2019 versus 2020. But 2020 number one was um, the addendum six. So we put in management and that changed harvest. And then we also had COVID and that presumably changed harvest and removals in some way that we can't uh, untangle from the effects of management, from the effects of that 2011 year class moving through, et cetera. So we used kind of an internal, you know, if we apply this regulation to 2020, what would it be if we didn't have a regulation change in 2020? And that's where that 14, roughly in the ocean, it's about 14% for the emergency action in 2024. In the Bay, it's about a 2% decrease in for the emergency action in 2024. So we are, that method is missing sort of the effect of the strong year class moving through the fishery and potential changes in abundance. Um, that's that's making it difficult to, to quantify. But that's part of why we're seeing a big change, a, a difference in kind of like our maximum predicted reduction on the 2023 emergency action effect versus the 2024 emergency action effect. Um, we don't have sort of we're, we're struggling with the availability of the data to characterize what's going to happen here. Um, so the and on paper, what happens is that our estimate of the emergency react, uh, reduction effects in 2024 is not enough to get you to the um, to the 14.5 percent reduction that we need. Um, we did the numbers. I don't think they're in the document, um, but they are basically if we're expecting overall about an 11 percent reduction if we keep the emergency actions in relative to 2024 compared to the 14%, 14.5% that we need overall. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's it's a lot. And um, I'm happy to clarify anything that was unclear on that. But as I said, I think we are really hitting the limits of what we can do with the data that we have and the assumptions that we can make about what the effects of how, how year class strength, how availability, how abundance, and how angler behavior are all interacting with these regulations to predict what's going to happen. Back here. Katie, I just need some clarification. Did you say there were no regulatory changes in the Chesapeake Bay in 2019? So from 18 to 19, there were there was no changes, or is that there there were minimal changes? Were there changes? Yes, there were. Um, we we implemented prior to the approval of addendum six in, in august of 2019 we adopted the one fish we went from two to one and we adopted um emergency emergency regulations on gill nets making it maximum seven inch mesh in the bay and nine inch nine inches so there were some going from two to one fish was a substantial change in regulations in 2019 in the bay so, so that may be part of it for at least Virginia is a smaller component of the overall cat, uh, removals in the Chesapeake Bay um, than Maryland. So that is part of it. I, but part of it is also the fact that if you look at the catch at age, there was um, basically those 2011 year classes were hanging around a bit in the Bay in 2018. They're almost gone out of the catch at age, virtually gone in 2019. So, they, and which is what we would expect to be happening with the 2015s um, from 2022 to 2023. But yeah, so there is probably a little bit of, of an effect on the recs. We also did not look at the, like this was purely on the recreational side. So the commercial side regulation change did not affect that this um, size frequency calculations, um, but it's possible that the bag limit change did to a small degree. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so we're gonna go to Adam, but before I call on him, 
I'm going to see a last show of hands so if we can move this into discussion. Anybody else have any burning questions? So Mike. All right, so we'll leave it at Mike. So it's going to be Adam and Mike, and then we're going to move into discussion. Thank you. So in the PDT memo on additional topics under the no targeting seasonal closures, uh, there's the statement the PDT recognizes there's continuing questions and concerns about enforcement of no targeting closures. So certainly none of this is a laughing matter. People, resources, these are all very uh, serious topics. Um, but this did make me think of a joke I'd heard about the person shipwrecked 100 miles from shore, started to swim, got 99 miles away, got tired, I can't make it, and they swim all the way back. Why is that relevant here? Well, I'm thinking about these no targeting closures and I'm thinking about all of our state enforcement agencies that have joint enforcement agreements with federal authorities. And we have an EEZ that is 197 miles wide from three to 220 miles. And it left me wondering, why is it that we can enforce no targeting in 197 miles of our coast, but we have a problem in the three miles closest to our coast. So I'm wondering if you could expand on what's different about that three miles versus the other 197 that would make a no targeting closure so difficult to enforce. Uh, Adam, I'm gonna go to Jeff Mercer, law enforcement. Up. I would say in general that a no targeting is difficult to enforce. It is difficult to enforce in federal borders. Um, it's just uh, something that is difficult to prove whether or not you're targeting striped bass or bluefish. We do our best with it, but it is uh, a measure that is very difficult for enforcement to enforce wherever it occurs. Go ahead, Adam, follow up. So just to follow up, there's nothing, there's no new inherent difficulty that the last three miles would incur that are, aren't are already a problem for the other 197 miles, if I understood that correctly. I don't know if you well, want there to... is a complete prohibition on retaining striped bass in the federal waters as well. So that makes it slightly easier on our end um, and we do take enforcement actions out there based upon that, but um, it is difficult to prove a case on targeting in federal waters. Would it be any less or more difficult in state waters? I can't really answer that. It's essentially the same thing, but it, it, it is a difficult case to prove. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Adam. Last uh, words or last uh, comments, Mike? Sorry, questions. Kate, if we could go back to the percentage reduction from the emergency action in 2024, I thought I just heard you say 11%, but I, I'd heard calculations say 14.1%. It's 14.1% for the ocean and about 2% for the bay. So when you add them together and combine with no changes on the commercial side, you get an 11% reduction overall. Okay, versus the 14.5 that's that we need overall. That answer your question, Mike? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> okay. So that was our last question. So we're going to go into discussion now, the most challenging part of this meeting. And I know the board knows this, but for the listening public, so the exercise we're about to embark upon uh, is to take this very um, well done and thorough uh, document created by the um, plan development team and then craft it into something that the public can, can really respond to and understand. Um, so part of that exercise is taking things out that we think are not necessary. And then also on the other end of the spectrum, things that may be missing and adding them to the document. And as Emerson had asked and Tony had replied, I think the strategy we want to employ is to take one section or the other, it really doesn't matter. Um, but once we start on recreational measures, let's stick with that 
and finish them. So 3.1 or 3.2 commercial. Um, and we'll go from there. So um, I will open the floor up. We can have some brief discussion, but when we put motions on the floor, we have limited time. Uh, that will hasten us to our, our conclusion. So I'll open it up. I'm gonna to go to Justin and then Emerson and then Adam and then Mike. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I wanted to ask, um, do we have to go in the order of talking about recreational and then commercial, or would you be open, uh, I mean, if it's the will of the board, too, to address the commercial section first? Yeah, it might not have been clear. We go either way. But once we start one, we'll, you know, once a motion's up for one, you want to throw a motion up right now, you can, you can start the process. <laughs> I am willing to do that, Mr. Chairman, but I'll defer to the fact that some other folks raised their hands and also wanted to participate in discussion, so I don't want to short circuit what they might have wanted to add. Okay, so, so you're going to you're going to hold that. Yep. Um, I think we had Emerson, and then we had um, Adam, and then Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I was prepared to make a motion relative to Section 3.1. Um, but I also have a motion relative to 3.2. So I'll make either one of those motions depending on where you want to start. Yeah, did you, you didn't send those motions, you, you just have them? Yeah. But they're just as valid as ones that were sent in previously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Read up very slowly, please. All right, Emerson, you get the honors. Lead us into uh, okay. Do you prefer whether I start with 3.1 or 3.2? 3.1. Okay. Move to add under 3.1.1 and under 3.1.2 an option that states that any recreational season closure implemented through this addendum would be a no harvest closure and an option that states that any recreational season closure implemented through this addendum would be a no targeting closure. And for members of the listening public, we are typing in um, Commissioner Hasbrook's motion, and we'll have it up on the screen in a moment, and we'll read it into the record.
and Emerson, just to clarify, the goal of this is for the public to choose whether it's a harvest closure or well, for the public to provide input, the board will choose whether this is a harvest closure or a no targeting closure. Yes, that's right. It's, it's to provide two options um, for any closures. One is that the closure would be a no harvest closure and the other option um, would be uh, to have a no targeting closure and to get public input on both of those options for any closure. All right, thanks Emerson. Do we have a second to this motion? Mike Luisi. All right, Emerson, you want to expand on your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so over 90% of the recreational catch is discarded. So if we look at data from the past 10 years, um, for some years, removals from harvest are greater than the discard mortality. And in some years, recreational discard mortality is greater than the recreational harvest. So harvest and release mortality um, have been pretty much evenly split in terms of which one comprise the majority of recreational removals over the past 10 years. So I don't know why we would not want to help address um, this high level of discard mortality, uh, or why we would not want to help address this um, high level of discard mortality by implementing um, no targeting. I, th I think we need to get at that somehow. And I know that um, there are enforcement issues, uh, but I keep hearing from the public uh, that, that the public wants to do the right thing to help rebuild this resource as quickly as possible. So I have to think that there will be um, compliance with no targeting, even if enforcement is problematic. Um, also, there currently are no targeting closures in the Chesapeake. And I also understand that we can't actually calculate what the reduction in fishing mortality will be with a no targeting closure, but um, we couldn't calculate that for some of the other things that we've implemented, circle hooks and no gapping, but we know that they're going to reduce uh, mortality. And, 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 and similarly with the no targeting closure, it, it's going to reduce that discard mortality. Thank you. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with Emerson. Um, I also agree with the points that Adam Nowalski made earlier. I, you know, I feel pretty strongly, and I've made this clear to the board that I think uh, no targeting closures are are appropriate in this fishery, uh, where the majority of the mortality is coming from fish being released. I realize that it's a large recreational fishery, and fish are always going to die after being released, but I think we can do something about it uh, from, the, from the board uh, to ensure that this sector of the fishing public um, is held to some standard that will help in the rebuilding of the spawning stock biomass. Emerson mentioned uh, that there are no targeting closures in the Chesapeake, um, Maryland, is one of the states that has a no targeting closure. And, um, you know, just to, to give you my own observation, I drove over the Bay, the Bay Bridge over the Chesapeake Bay uh, on the second day of the no targeting, no harvest closure um, last weekend, a couple weekends ago, and the boats were dramatically reduced. Now there were still some people out jigging on the pilings but there were a lot less boats than there were a few days before that. So while it's difficult to quantify, I think it's really important. And I think it's a way for the truly passionate angler to um, accept the fact that this stock needs more than what we are able to do with the tools that we have. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think I know this conversation is going to go down the road of nothing really works for anyone uh, as far as options being presented. And I, we're at that point, I think, where we need to start making some difficult decisions. And this will be a great opportunity uh, to get the feedback from the public. So that's why I seconded it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. 
All right, thank you, Mike. We'll open it up for discussion. Anyone? Doug Brown. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I normally am, am, am very supportive of, uh, you know, providing the public with the uh, opportunity to uh, address options in the, in the uh, uh, plans that we put forward. Um, right now, this document, I'll give you folks my feeling is this document is way too complex for the public. We have got to narrow this down to something that's simple because otherwise your public will be spinning their heads. <laughs> and if Emerson, you had presented this after we'd done some pairing, I, I would probably uh, support putting it in. But right now, adding one more thing uh, on top before we start cutting things out uh, and narrowing it down, um, it, it's going to be difficult for me to um, to support it at this point. You know, I might suggest you know we table it towards the end uh, and bring that up as an option at that point. But and, and the other thing that I wanted to ask the Bay, the members of the Bay states that have non-targeting uh, options, have they, has their law enforcement ever been able to bring a case forward uh, uh, and get a conviction for someone who was targeting during those periods? Thank you, Doug. I'll tell you this much, PRC has a no targeting um, provision and I, my understanding is that law enforcement officers have written tickets. They've also told me that when they approached them and asked them if they were fishing for striped bass, they admitted they were. So they admitted they were fishing, they issued the ticket. Um, but that's about as much as I know about it. Um, I think, Mike, I don't know if you have any comments from your, your side. No, I'm sorry. I don't have any detailed information about the actual enforcement. I do know that um, the first year we had the the rule in effect, it was more of a warning shot across the bow uh, for anglers that were found to be targeting striped bass. But um, in recent years, I haven't I haven't followed up with any exact details on the on what's being enforced. Although I know it's it is being enforced, people are being stopped, tickets are being written, but how many of them get prosecuted? I don't. I'm not sure. Go ahead, Tony. You want to add some? Uh, and Mike, I think you hit home for the law enforcement committee. Often, it's where the rubber hits the road is the tickets can be written, but how well they can be prosecuted in court is um, another story. And we can try to see if we can get some more information on that. But um, I just wanted to note, relative to the discard mortality um, in 2022 the um, release mortality is actually starting to go down. So um, in 21, it was 50% overall of the release mortality. And in 2022, it was 39%. So it's not at those highest levels anymore. And then um, in terms of the, uh, the discards themselves from the ocean, and the bay, those values also went down in 21 um, to 2022. Thank you, Tony. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I actually do, don't have anything uh, relative to the motion, but I wanted to let you know that I have a motion relative to these same sections. So I just wanted to let you know that in case, you know, process wise, you wanted to come to me sometime in the near future. So you have a motion you want to offer up potentially at some point. At this point, okay. All right. So let's go to Dave Sikorsky. Thank you, Marty. Um, coming from the Bay perspective and seeing what no uh, no targeting closures have done, um, I would you know disagree slightly with Mr. Luisi. Um, this year we've had a concentration of fishing in one place, one place only for the most part, Baltimore Harbor. Um, and so the reflection of what's happening on the Chesapeake Bay is today is very different than 2017 when we were looking at you know, the benchmark assessment and how do we address the majority of removals coming from discards. Also, the Chesapeake Bay, in my knowledge, to my knowledge, has never had a majority source of removals coming from dead discards. We are a harvest focused fishery, at least in Maryland. And so our dressing harvest is the way that you can address mortality. 
Um, I have some concerns about quantifying, you know, no harvesting, no, no targeting closures and their value in trying to chase this fishery that's continuing to, de continuing to decline. Um, I think it's, I don't look at catch and release as a sector, you know, similar to what Mr. Luisi said, you know, catch and release people. I look at catch and release fishing as a reality of recreational fishing. I look at dead discards as a reality of commercial fishing, and we should manage those wasted dead fish in whichever way we can. But if we continue to talk about it in sectors and groups of people and demographics, we're making a grave mistake in the, in the current trajectory of this fishery. So I, I really look forward to seeing what the public would have to say on this. Um, I generally don't support implementing no targeting. I don't think it's a successful way to quantify saving fish at this stage of this fishery. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, so I I know we have a lot of motions to go through and we're gonna have to move these, these, these discussions to votes pretty quickly. So if you have a burning issue, I desire to comment on this before we call the question, let me know. Otherwise, you know, I wanna move this forward. I'm not seeing any burning. Well, I, I see, Robert, you wanna, go ahead. Oh uh, yes, so uh, we have a lot of problem out there. Not only with uh, these uh, fish that is a catch release, it happens more than just during the summer months. It happens during the winter months. It happens during the spawning season. And it's time when the season is over. The season is over, and it's it's got to come to a halt because dead discards is why we're here today. If we didn't have the dead discards, we wouldn't be here on this topic. Thank you. All right, thanks, Robert T. So let me go ahead and like to call a question if we could. And we have I know we have three board members that have motions they want to tee up. So we've got a lot of things that are starting to pile up. Um, so does it need a caucus on this? All right. There is? Okay, let's caucus. We'll give it 30 seconds. All right, it is time. So we'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland, Delaware. Those opposed? New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Abstentions? No fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service. Null votes. The motion passes 10 4 2. All right, thank you for that. Um, we, we have three board members that have motions teed up. So I'd like to respect those and the individual that I have that has participated the least, I'm gonna give him the next option. That's gonna be Mike Armstrong. Then we're gonna go to Adam. And then we're gonna go to, third one is, who am I missing? Jay. Justin. Oh, Jason, I'm sorry, Jason. And then Justin, Justin, you have one? Okay, that's the cue. All right, go ahead, Mike, you're up. It, I don't think I'm the only one here that's having real hard time grasping all these percentages. In fact, I was just blindsided by that 11%. I thought it was 14.1 because a lot of it's not in the document. Um, but I think my motions are still valid, but it's all about sequencing. So we need to get percentages who are pretty darn close with 14.1 on the coast with the emergency action. We need some from the commercial. We need some from the Bay. And so from a sequential point of view, I would say 
we start with those and end with the uh, coast, maybe. Well, but that's you know that's based on my. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and go with the uh, Chesapeake Bay option, which currently is only counting for a couple of percentage points because it's a 31 inch maximum size, um, which does almost nothing in the bay. So uh, let me throw this motion out. Move to amend Chesapeake Bay recreational options B and D to include maximum size limit options ranging from 23 to 26 uh, in one inch increments and remove all other options. And there's a lot of explaining to do there if I get a second. All right, do we have a second to the motion? Justin Davis. All right, go ahead, Mike. Um, first off, I, you know, we have to deal with this, the season thing, the input I've heard is it's a non-starter. These, they're so difficult to implement the recoupment. We don't calculate the enforcement. We don't calculate, um, and the TC admits they, they don't know the effect of these. Um, and yet we're using them. We're only using them to get a couple extra percentage points. So all my options are going to be get rid of the seasonal components and see if we can get close to the required 14.5% cut we need to, to hit the F target. Um, so I limited all the, all the options with um, seasons. And so you look at option B, at a 23 inch, it's 17.8 percent reduction. So I'm proposing 23 to 26. So it would be incrementally less. I don't know if we probably don't have time for analysis, and maybe we we don't need analysis. We sometimes common sense should guide us. And option D is uh, similar. So we have the same season as last year. We have. Um, the maximum size will be subject to 23 to 26, whatever we pick. Um, the difference between B and D is we will do a 20 inch size among all Chesapeake jurisdictions. And I think there's something very attractive to getting all the bay on uh, one size. And I think uh, I'll leave it at that. We need reduction from the bay. Um, we can't leave it at 31 or we're not gonna be able to use just the emergency action. We're gonna, if we can't get to it, we're gonna have to use seasons. I don't know of anyone here that wants a season, and I, we are completely opposed. They're so disruptive. They're disruptive to tourism. They're disruptive to for hire fleets, and and the whole recoupment of uh, yeah, sure, I'm gonna take two weeks off from fishing, and I'm gonna do my fishing uh, the day after it opens again. So. I don't know what we really get out of them. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Justin, do you have anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair. That the only thing I'll add is that, from my perspective, um, if I'm understanding the motion correctly, it's this is sort of adding new options in, at, you know, taking some out as well, and that, you know, I, I think we would need analysis of these various options to see reduction they achieve. So I think yeah. from my standpoint, voting this up would sort of be a, an affirmation at this point that we're not sending this out for public comment today, that we'd be kicking it back to the PDT for additional analysis. But that's my perspective. I'd be here interested in hearing perspectives from other members of the board. All right. Thanks, Justin. So what I'd like to do is take two um, comments in favor, two opposed, and call the question. Mr. Chair, can I, can I re-comment? Uh, one other piece I forgot is the smaller size limit offered some protection to the 28, 2018 year class that are still milling around the bay um, and will come back because that's uh, that's all we got left is the 2018. So that'll offer some protection to that too. In regards to analysis, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I live and breathe by the science, but there is so much uncertainty in every single step of this analysis. No one's fault. We just don't have the ability to predict landings. We're saying we get a 30% cut from the EA. Well, 
maybe we got a 50 percent or on the other side maybe we got a 10 percent cut we don't really know until the data come in um so uh, to a point sometimes these analyses are misleading or giving us false hope um so I'm torn about sending it back to be reanalyzed. We know the direction. We know if, the, you know, at, at a, a 23 inch, we get 17.8. Well, we know it's less than 26 inches. I, I don't know. I know a lot of people aren't comfortable with, with moving in that direction, but we got to get something out and we got to get something out quick um, and, and get our ducks in the row for when problems really start. We're not in a big problem yet, but it's coming. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. So what I'd like to do is two um, supporting comments and two opposing alternating. So I'd like to rate, show your hands if you'd like to support this. So, okay, call that, go ahead, Tony. Just to be clear, option B and D would maintain the season for the Chesapeake Bay fisheries and maintain the bag limit as they are in 2022. It would just adjust in option B, the maximum size limit and option D, it adjusts the minimum and the maximum size limit for clarification. Thank you, Tony. I didn't explain that well. All right, thanks, Tony. So a supporting comment, Megan. I don't know if I'm supporting or not, but I'll, I'll <laughs> provide where I'm at. Um, so things I like, I think that this actually does simplify this section of the document. It took poor Tony, I timed it, 35 minutes to go through the management alternatives alone on this document. So I I think we have to start cutting heavily here. And, and so I like that, that this is accomplishing that. Um, I would also agree with what Mike said in terms of the harvest closures. I think there's a lot of uncertainty specifically around that management tool. We have, I think, a sentence in the draft addendum that says, uh, the TC is not recommending closures less than two weeks because of uncertainty. I think there's a lot of things there that make us on slightly shakier ground with those closures. Um, maybe to more of Justin's point, it's not clear to me kind of the range of reductions that this will uh, lead us to. Um, and so that makes me a little nervous about, I, I just don't know what the 26 inch maximum will, will get us. Um, I think at this point I'm willing to consider this for the other two reasons I stated, but if this goes forward, I think some things that may be helpful depending on where we up, end up in the document is, I don't know if there's confidence intervals around these percent removals or not. If there are, that may be helpful. Or um, having some sort of key almost at the end where if we're looking at commercial ocean and uh, bay rec measures, I think the public's gonna wanna know how they add up together we're gonna to have to think of some way to present that in a in a concise way, which is on the board to re remove alternatives, but um, I can see that being a potential challenge. Thanks, Megan. An opposing comment. Mike Louisi, and we'd like to keep these comments if we could to a minute, let's try to tighten this up. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very quick. I'm not sure if I oppose it or or support it right now, and I I understand the intention, but I think I well. My question is, if we deviate, let's say we just take option B and we start to add one inch to the maximum size in increments of one inch to 24, 25, and 26. Eventually, that overall reduction is going to drop below the 16 percent, and I think that's clear in what what Mike is putting forward. I just think it sets it sets a stage for the Chesapeake Bay to be to be characterized as a, as the region that doesn't need to pull its up, pull its weight here, and that we can get around the options uh, presented and not take the full reduction. Which so I'm not sure if it was intended to be that way. I don't think it was. In, tended in any bad vein, um, but I just, I don't know if I can support coming out to the public with options that shows the Chesapeake Bay 
isn't meeting the demand of the addendum for some other purpose. Uh, it's, it's just hard for me to think through. Um, thanks, Marty. All right, thanks, Mike. I think Katie has a clarifying comment. So, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think you know, Megan raised an excellent point about, you know, are there confidence intervals around these reductions? And there are not. I mean, I think if you want to think about this, like talking about that, the 2013 prediction of, you know, under one set of assumptions, we're seeing, we're predicting a 30% reduction, under another, we're predicting an 18% reduction. So I think if we, depending on how we did these reductions on paper with the 2024, we would likely see a, a range of, of numbers here. So I think the question is kind of how much, at this point, we are very focused on these point estimates of what's on paper. I think we've already raised, people have already raised the issue of, is a 10 day closure worth the uncertainty that we're getting here? Of, are we trying to chase a few percentage points on paper by putting in a measure that is likely to not be effective, um, that or that we that we have a very difficult time even quantifying the effects. Um, and I know we've seen in other species, in other species, the difficulties of trying to hit these point estimates with tweaking seasons a few days here, a few days there, and it has not worked out. So I think it seems like we are maybe trying to. There's an option on the table to try to move away from seasons as trying to tweak these numbers. But then the question is, you know, what are we doing on paper? How are we presenting these? We're very focused on the kind of this point estimate of the reduction. And I think it's going to be, there's uncertainty there that's difficult for us to quantify. But maybe an option would be instead of focusing on the percent reduction that we're anticipating here, let's try to focus on maybe what is the probability of achieving F in F target in 2024 with these measures um, instead of trying to say this is going to get you a 16% reduction, this is going to get you a 17.2 reduction um, and focus more on here's options and here's on here's the risk of achieving or not achieving F target in 2024 where I think some of the uncertainty of population size, um, abundance, things like that do get translated through better into that probability than something looking right now, trying to track on paper, chase a few percentage points with a few days of closure here or there, um, which does require, it would require a revision to how we have presented these options um, and kind of how we've talked about them. We haven't done these calculations, but it would be relatively straightforward to do. Maybe that would provide the board and the public more um, a better framework for understanding kind of the uncertainty and the risk um, as opposed to trying to chase some of these point estimates, a few percentage points on paper where there's already a lot of uncertainty. All right, thank you, Katie. Two more comments, one in support. Pat, you have a supporting comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I don't have a big problem with 25, 26. I'm a little concerned about having that range be as low as 23 because the slot limit would be so small, especially during the summer months where there's intense fishing, water temperatures were warm, the release mortality is much higher than 9% in those warm temperatures. So um, I'm a little concerned about that. Thank you, Pat. One last comment opposing Dave Sikorsky. Thank you, Marty. Um, I think removing option H from the document is a mistake. Um, it has a 19 inch size limit, 19 inch minimum, which is our current regulation in Maryland. Um, that regulation seems to balance availability of fish and the dead discard issue a little bit. You know, of course, if we have smaller size limits, we have less dead discards in, in the bay. Um, and so I, I would want option H to continue on. Uh, another component of option H is the one fish for all modes. It does not have a mode split. If we remove that, we would not give the public a chance to weigh in for Chesapeake Bay options, which include no mode split and mode splits, you know, both paths down the road. So as written, I have, I have an issue with this motion. All right, thank you, Dave. We'll call the question. I'll go ahead and do a 30 second caucus. So that's good with everybody. Unless you need more time. Let's go to 30 seconds to see how it works.
All right, we'll call. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll look for you for direction on this, Mr. Chairman, but I think given Mr. Sikorsky's comments, I think we can maybe address some of the overall concern here if you would allow me to amend the motion at this time. Okay, so I'd move to amend. And after the word options, I guess the way to say it would be to accept option H or increments and remove all other options with the exception of option H. Mr. Chair, procedural question. I'm happy to take this as a friendly amendment. I don't I don't know the procedure. Whatever is easiest. I think the easy way here is after increments, instead of and remove all other options, you would say and remove whichever options we'd like to remove. So the original intent would be option C removed, option E removed, option F removed, and option, option G removed. We could remove I as well. The goal would be that H stay in place, and I think Mr. Luisi has something to add in regard to that. Yeah, I think, so if you guys are okay with it, I think with Dave, the language that Dave had would specify what comes out rather than saying it's all coming out except for one, one of the additional pieces. If we can do that quickly, um, I also, while staff are working on the language, you know, I think I think it would be important, um, especially in our region, given the fact that we have mode splits. Um, I would like to see the H alternative, which is in the draft memo um, from the PDT, uh, be included in this as well under H. So H1, HA. I don't know how you what what you want to refer to it as, um, but it's called option H alternative in the draft memo. And what that does is uh, it establishes a the same minimum size limit for all jurisdictions with the same maximum size limit of 23 inches. However, it does consider a two fish bag limit for the char party charter. And that would be for all jurisdictions. So let's do it as a separate motion. Because that is, different subject matter i think it would be easier mike if we could take up mode splits on its own and not incorporate it in here if that's i'm fine with okay. that that's fine thank you thank you all right so we have it up on the screen and it's second. We only read it in. Mike, can you go ahead and read that in? Looks like it's me. Sorry, Dave. It's Sorry. the amended version. Go ahead, Dave Sikorsky. Good Move job. to amend to replace, oh, and I quote, all other options, end quote, with option, quote, option e, C, E, F, G, and I, end quote. I'm not sure I read that very well, but. All right, thank you, Dave, and seconded by John Clark. All right, very good. All right, Dave, you want to quickly speak to that? Real quick. No need to. I think I've already explained it. John, any comments? All good. Caucus, 30 seconds. Could I, just a clarification, sorry. Sure. It, it, the 23-inch, that's not subject to the 23, 24, 25, 26. Is that under H? The no, max it could. size is set. 
yeah, as written, it, it would be. And I would only offer that that make, makes any sense because there's a 22.4% reduction for option I or H right now. So I think there's some wiggle right. room. You could potentially increase the maximum size of the slot and still stay within the reductions, I think. That's from, but. The way you wrote it is not it, correct. Yeah, I'm not you sure did not, when you written. said your motion, that is not what you said. You said you just wanted H, not to have it in the maximum size limits. So all you need to do is add option H to B and D. Yes. <laughs> add option H to options B and D in the original motion. That's part of my amendment, please. Sorry. Second, you're good with that? Alphabet's tough. Adam, did you have a clarifying question? That was it right there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's try that caucus again. 30 seconds. All right, we'll go ahead and call the question. Before I do that, I'm, because of the back and forth, I'm gonna just read this into the record. The move to amend Chesapeake Bay recreational options B and D to include maximum size limit options ranging from 23 inches to 26 inches in one inch increments and remove all other options. That was the original motion by Dr. Armstrong, seconded by Dr. Davis. Then there was a move to amend to add H after D, that motion was by Mr. Sikorsky, seconded by Mr. Clark. So we're voting on the amended motion. And I'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. New Hampshire, Maine, Delaware, Maryland, District of Columbia, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, that is everybody, I believe. 16? Yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Uh, so now the, may, the amended motion becomes the main motion, and I guess we can do this by consent, I believe, right? So are any opposition to the main motion? Okay. Okay. All right. Is there any objections to what is now the main motion? Seeing none, motion passes. All right. Let's try to keep things moving. Um, Adam, I know you are next in the queue, but can I please ask you this? Because we've decided to kind of stick with these Chesapeake Bay rec, we're just going to hold you if that's okay. And so, Jason, it's your time, and then just Justin, Jason, and then Joe, Jason, and then Justin. I got it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I uh, launch in here, I'm just noting the previous motion altered my motion. I sent it to Tony. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Um, thanks. Uh, so thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I have a motion. Uh, it's relevant to um, the sections that we've been talking about, so I'll just go to it. So I would like to move to add new options to section 3.1.1 and 3.1.2 uh, in the draft addendum 2 that allow for mode splitting. These are options B, C, and D as defined in the PDT memo to the board dated July 17, 2023 for section 3.1.1 and option H as defined in the PDT memo to the board dated July 17, 2023 for section 3.1.2. So that's my motion. Um, if I get a second, I will uh, give you some reasoning. Second is by Emerson Hasbrook. And go ahead, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just some reasoning behind the motion. Um, all of the options in the motion still achieve uh, significant reductions. All of the options still require the party and charter industry to implement slot limits 
so they so they'd still be participating in the management concept of gear class protection, supplying stock biomass protection, um, all of the things we're trying to achieve with slot limits. The party and charter mode, uh, I'm sorry, the party and charter industry is a small component of the overall removals. Um, and this is talking about the the ocean fishery. It's it's more in the in the bay, but it's between three and six percent, uh, depending on whether you're looking at harvest or total removals. The party and charter mode is a unique and different segment of our fisheries. So in the same way that we're comfortable managing commercial fisheries under different regulations, we should have the same comfort managing the party and charter industry. Uh, differently as it's unique from both the commercial and recreational segments uh, of the fishery. Given the business model of this segment of the fishery, I'm generally concerned about the solvency of this industry, um, in particular those that focus on the striped bass fishery, which is a lot of them, um, and feel that by allowing for some flexibility in management, we can offer some relief to this segment of the fishery while still meeting our management goals with striped bass. And then finally, just to um, offer the point, we're simply seeking public comment on uh, concepts at this point. So this is a really good opportunity to get feedback on this topic from across the spectrum of opinions, which I think we'll probably get a sampling of right now. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Emerson, anything to add to that as seconder? No, Jason did an excellent job at justification. I don't have anything to add. I agree with everything you said. All right, thank you, Emerson. So same strategy, two in favor, two opposed. In favor, Adam? So neutral. Yeah, I'm going to speak in favor of this ultimately. Uh, but before I do so, I believe Dr. McNamee referenced needing to change this relative to recent motions. And I believe the option H in the PDT memo explicitly had a minimum and a maximum of 19 to 23 and the last motion set out incremental so I think at a minimum this motion would need to reflect that option H at a minimum remove the all modes would have a size limit of 19 to 23 inch if that is in fact the motion makers intent um, beyond that, I'll just say that I would speak in favor of leaving this in. Uh, as we've heard before, it is generally the policy of this commission to be inclusive with regards to what we send out for public comment. Uh, the nature of the mode split question is clearly one that is very polarizing. Uh, we'll certainly hear comment here today, but I think it would serve us well as a board and as a body uh, to get that comment officially on the record regarding this species in particular. Thanks, Adam. Opposing comment? I have another supporting comment, and then we'll call the question. Justin. Thanks, Mr. Chair, but I'll defer to Jason, the maker of the motion. Looks like he has something to add. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, uh, Justin, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Um, I had mentioned that my motion changed based on the last motion, and that was because um, one of the options I specifically had come off the board. Um, I'm anticipating potentially one of these options for the ocean fishery may also come off the board. So I just wanted to kind of state that if an option gets removed by the board, uh, it would be my understanding that it would also remove this mode split option, the one that paralleled it. So I'm hoping that makes um, sense. We can come back and do a motion to that effect, or maybe there's some other procedure that makes sense. But I didn't intend for it, it, it's all the sequencing as challenging with this, as you well know. So if one of these options comes off, you know, maybe we can revisit and amend this or something like that. Doug? Just to Jason, I know you were sidebarring with Tony, but um, Adam made a good point about option A is defined by the PDT and the board memo. Now, option H now has 
a series of maximum size increments. Is that, are you talking about, um, does a party charter vote also? All right, let's make our way back to the board. I just ordered three dozen pizzas. Should I up that order? <laughs> Why are you calling me at that? Okay, let's reconvene the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission's Atlantic Striped Bass Management Board. And I think to pick it up where we left off, um, Doug Grout, can we go back and, and kind of start with your comments and, uh, and kind of rehash those and get us off to a good start? Thanks, Doug. Go ahead. I forget. <laughs> No, I'll, I'll put it in in, in uh, much quicker terms. Uh, please be aware that the option H in the memo is now different than the option H that we just uh, modified. And so if we could uh, have some uh, clarity on which H uh, you mean and how, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the um, the power outage was convenient. It gave me a, a minute to to think this through with Mike and and Doug. So my intent was that the modified the new modified option H for 3.1.2. Um, I think it's still so in the memo it specifies a single slot because that's what existed before, but there. I think it is logical to allow the slot to be in these increments that the the new um, the the motion we made prior to this one sets up, and it just adds the extra fish for the um, party and charter sector, and that was what the original um, example given in the the memo offered. Anyways, it, the modes all have the same slot and it just added a fish for the party and charter so that's what the intent would be and i think it i think it's okay um the way that it's up there did emerson second yeah I, emerson seconded Yes. Okay, so we've had comment, we've clarified the motion. We're ready to call the question. Do you need a caucus? No. We'll call the question then. All those in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. New Hampshire, Delaware, Maryland, District of Columbia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, New York. Sorry. All those opposed? Maine, North Carolina, Massachusetts. Abstentions? No fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service. No, sorry, no votes? The motion passes 11-3-2. All right, I think that takes us to Dr. Davis. You had one ready for us, Justin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I do, but it does not have to do with the sections we've been dealing with, and I just want to acknowledge that Adam was ahead of me in the queue. So uh, if we're moving to a new section, I'll defer to Adam. Yeah, and I think, Adam, but yours is related to the commercial section. Mine would be most, mine is in the uh, background section, but is related to Emerson's first motion. What was that, two days ago now? So how about if we go to ocean options and hold Justin yours and, and hold Adam still, so we still have you in the queue. Are there any ocean options? Dr. Armstrong. I have a motion. If you like the last one, you're going to love this one. Um, let me find it. Um, move to replace ocean recreational option B with a slot limit of 28 to 31 
and no seasonal harvest closure and remove option C and D. Do we have a second? Jerry Patterson. Mike, can you speak to your motion? Hold on. Again, in the interest of uh, simplifying things, we're going from four options to two, one of its status quo. But it goes back to the linchpin is do we believe that seasonal um, closures are appropriate now? I don't. And I, and I think it's needless, needlessly complicating things. Um, so that gets us a 14.1 cut. And I kind of wish that we had talked about commercial first, because I believe there's going to be a cut suggested there. That'll get us more. We, we just got a fair amount of cut from the bay. We don't know how much, but it's a lot more than the 31 inches. Um, so I think the standalone with all these together will come close to 14.5%, which is what we need when, when everyone's participating. Um, I got rid of option D because I don't think now is the time to be changing the minimum size. I mean, God, we have compliance issues already. We, we don't need a 30 inch size. Um, and option C only gets us 11% as a standalone without seasonal. And that to me isn't enough and probably not worth going to public hearing with. Um, and so we're left with the emergency action or status quo. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Comments, Shuri, as seconder? Um, Mike covered it. Um, I, I don't think seasons are something that um, will be consistent for us. So I don't think we should be considering those. Thanks. All right, thank you, Cherie. So we'll take, again, two comments in favor, two against. Uh, in favor, comments. Go, John Clark. Uh, more just a question. Isn't this pretty much just bringing us back to status quo? Status quo. Oh, no. Okay. No, this is, I mean, this is the emergency <laughs> regular. So the options would just be status quo and the emergency. Okay, got it. Uh, I'm fine with that. All right, thank you, John. Doug? Yeah, I uh, will support this as I was as I supported the uh, uh, changes to get rid of the uh, seasonal options in the Chesapeake Bay. And my main reason for this is something that I've heard throughout my career from uh, the MRFs, from uh, the MRIP staff, is it really seasons less than seasonal closures less than a wave are really highly uncertain. I know a lot of states have been using those, but the data is not set up to just split. Uh, uh, to, I have closures that are less than a wave because, as we all know, in a two-month period, the uh, fishing catching can change dramatically. So you are adding a tremendous amount of uncertainty to uh, uncertainty to your estimates here. So the only time I would support any kind of a seasonal closure with any fishery is at the wave level. Thank you, Doug. Opposing comment? Adam? Yeah, thank you very much. So this board has not had to sit through too many monitoring committee meetings, if any, with the Mid-Atlantic Council and Summer Flounder, Black Sea Bass, Scub, Bluefish, where our technical advice has continually been for the two decades I've been part of these meetings, that the best way to constrain harvest is through seasonal closures, period. That is the advice we have been given ad nauseum. So given I'm opposed to this motion uh, on the grounds that that's the advice I've heard over and over and over again. Uh, given the earlier motion that this board passed from Emerson regarding including different ways of addressing those closures, both harvest as well as targeting, I think that this motion is now inconsistent 
with the previous action that this board has took on that earlier motion. Uh, I think this is essentially just taking an emergency action that was passed with the idea of, well, it's just an emergency action until we can get an addendum in place. And now we're putting it in place potentially for the foreseeable future. There has to be some additional options here as to what striped bass management is going to look like moving forward, not just one single slot limit that is in direct contrast to where removals have come from in the past, takes no action to address them. Uh, I can't support this motion. All right, thank you, Adam. Unless there's a burning desire for more comment, I'd like to call the question. Don't see any. 30 second caucus. All right, we'll go ahead and call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Massachusetts, NOAA, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Maine, New Hampshire. Those opposed? Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, District of Columbia. Abstentions. Fish and Wildlife Service. No votes. Connecticut. Can the yeses raise your hand again? Never mind. Motion carries 8611. All right, we'll move, keep moving. We're still looking for ocean motions. Any, anyone? Any more rec motions, recreational motions? Adam. So I would like some clarity on where this leaves Emerson's motion that we started out with today. Because if that motion was to include the no targeting provisions for seasonal closures, and this motion now removes seasonal closures as options, where's that leave that earlier motion? Adam, I took Emerson's motion as to any option that got moved forward that had a season closure, it would also contain a no targeting closure. That was the gist of his motion or the implication of his motion. So right now the board has not put forward an option that has a season closure. So therefore there is not an option to add a no targeting closure at this time. All right, last call for recreational uh, uh, motions. Jason. Sorry, Mr. Chair, no, mo um, no motion for me. I have a question about what this does to the motion that I put forward um, because now there is no, the way the PDT memo reads it, you know, kind of aligns the slots, changes them. Uh, by widening them a little bit, but says that the you know seasonal closures. So my assumption is it would now align with the new motion that just passed, which means that there would be no seasonal closure for a party in charter mode either. But the slot limit would be the same. So I'm just get, seeking clarification on that. Uh, Jason, as I read the example option, in the PDT memo, it only specifies the um, the size limit. It doesn't have any specification to the season closure. In the text surrounding it, it said, you know, the all the other measures would apply to the party and charter as it does to the private and shore boats. So the only thing that this option in itself is doing is changing that slot for the party and charter and so that your option still does that. And based on what you said before, for clarity for the board, it removes the C and D. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Jason, and thank you, Tony. Again, so back to recreational options and any mo any last motions on the recreational side. Seeing none, let's move to commercial. And um, let's go with Justin, and I see John and Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I sent a memo over to staff, so I'll wait to see if it appears on the screen. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. I move. All right, hold on, everybody. Sorry, it's going to take a while. I move to remove options B1, no quota adjustment, and C2, FMP standard as starting point from section 3.2.1, options for implementing a commercial maximum size limit from draft addendum two. Task the PDT with conducting spawning potential analysis to determine quota reductions assorted with each option in option sets D, ocean commercial maximum size limits, and E, Chesapeake Bay commercial maximum size limits. Add a new option set to section 3.2.1 containing the following options for reductions to commercial quotas. Option A, status quo, all commercial fisheries maintain 2017 size limits. Oh, it should be or addendum six approved CE plans and amendment seven quotas and addendum six approved CE adjusted quotas or option B, commercial quota reductions, quotas for all commercial fisheries will be reduced by 14.5% from 2022 commercial quotas, including quotas adjusted through approved addendum six CE plans. And if I get a second, happy to speak to the rationale for the motion. Thank you, Justin. Second, Mike Armstrong. Go ahead, Justin. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so kind of in the spirit of being down here in Washington, DC, I am proposing adding something to the document, but I think I have a pay for it here. I'm removing something as well. So hopefully this all kind of balances out. Um, the intent here is to sort of create two, I guess I would say option paths within the commercial section. One, to apply a maximum size limit to the commercial fishery and do the spawning potential analysis to understand the quota reductions that would go along with that, or going down the path of just taking a standard, consistent 14.5% reduction in commercial quota across the board. So the way, and I hope this reads the way I intend, and if not, I'm open to suggestions, but the intent here is that, you know, the board would have to decide either to go down the road of doing a maximum size limit on the commercial fishery, or, take a 14.5% reduction from all commercial quotas or stay status quo on, on commercial quota. Um, I'll acknowledge that this is sort of a deviation from the initial intent and, and motivation of the addendum and the discussion we had on the record back in May. Um, what I said when I made the motion to start the addendum was that we should focus on implementing a maximum size limit for the commercial fishery, not quota reductions. I think what we found out once the PDT dug into that, and I have to thank the PDT for all the work they did on this document, um, that, that it turned out to be a very complex issue. If we impose a maximum size limit, but don't adjust quotas through the spawning potential analysis, as we learned earlier, we could actually have the potential to increase removals, which runs counter to what we want to do. I think also we can't ask anyone, any jurisdiction to vote for a maximum size limit with a commercial quota adjustment until they understand what that adjustment's gonna be. So we have to have the spawning potential analysis, I think, to show jurisdictions what they would be selecting if, if they choose a maximum size limit. Um, as an alternative option, just doing a 14.5% reduction across the board for commercial quota is relatively simple. You know, that 14.5% number comes from, that's the reduction removal we're looking to get in this document to get down to F target. Uh, and I think that would provide sort of an equal reduction across the board, whereas we saw, you know, with a maximum size limit, that's gonna impact different jurisdictions and states differently. Uh, so 14.5% would be uniform across the board. So that's sort of my intent in making the motion here is to hopefully simplify the section dealing with a maximum size limit for the commercial fishery, but also provide an alternative of just doing a straight across the board quota reduction. All right, thank you, Justin. Mike, uh, comments a seconder? Very briefly, yeah, I, I like this motion. I, 
I, I like how it takes out B1 and C2 because I don't think those are particularly topics that are germane for public input. I think those are board decisions. Uh, my question is, do we need to add language that moves B2 into the document? And I, I, my original, to address this, I said, move to remove commercial set, option set B and specify the quotas will be adjusted using spawning potential analysis. Do we need, right now it's just leaving an option just sitting there all alone. I see what you're saying, Mike. Uh, through this motion, motion, Justin has chosen B2 for the D and E set on right. its own. So you actually remove B2 because you've already chosen it in your motion, Justin. Does that make sense? That's how I interpret it anyway. So are you saying essentially I've removed option set B because we made a decision there? So, you know, we've chosen quota adjustment there's no need to leave in option set B, essentially. Correct. And the same for option set C. We, If this motion's voted up, we're choosing uh, 2022 as the starting point for the adjustments. So we're, you know, making that. I, that's my intent. That matches my intent. So if this should be reworded to reflect that, I'm open to that. So maybe we could alter that motion to say remove option on the B's, what do we call it? The options set B and options set C. Uh, potential yeah, you can get rid of the parentheticals, that's fine. But we don't want them to go away, the remaining one. Do we need language that says specify in the document that this is the way we will do it? Mr. Chair, if it's I can in the make motion, a right? Go ahead, Justin. I think the wording of the motion, given that we're tasking the PDT with conducting the spawning potential analysis, that sort of covers that, you know, we've selected that option under option set B, we might need some language saying we're using 2022 as the starting point for the adjustments. And it's noted um, just for the record that 2022 is also those CE plans if used. <laughs> Clarification suit the maker and seconder? Good. Okay. All right. Thank you both. Thanks everybody for your patience. And we'll open this up, uh, take comments again for and against. Start with uh, supporting comments. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm still trying to digest this whole comment or this whole motion. Up Part of it is what I was going to propose as a motion, which was removing C, but I was just wondering if it would be possible, uh, the maximum size limits um, as was put forth in the PDT memo are really a real problem for gillnet fisheries, which I think is pretty much from Delaware South and the Chesapeake there. And I was wondering if we can, with this motion, just exempt the gillnet fisheries from looking at maximum size limits because, and replace it with mesh size limits, uh, or would that have to be a whole separate option? Or, I mean, a whole separate motion here rather than just amending this. So, John, it sounds like you could go either way, um, but the mesh size might be problematic. Uh, Tony or Katie, you can, can you explain why, I guess, the... John, for the mesh size, what is, uh, and I guess through your, if you substitute them or substitute the motion, or if you do a separate motion, 
be helpful to have an understanding of what's your intention of how to determine what that mesh size would be. Would they be exempted once it's figured out? Um, I, I don't know if we'll be able to f determine a mesh size well, I think to take out could, your public comment. Perhaps what we could do is, um, you know, if we wanted to make a grand unified motion, if for in addition to maximum size limits, um, well, I guess because mesh size is not in there, I, I'm just curious as to whether we could just add it. You know, if we're already going to be examining what happens with maximum sizes in the commercial fishery, can we look at the corresponding mesh sizes? The, I think with mesh sizes, we can get pretty close to a maximum size. But of course, it's not going to be perfect because there's still going to be catching fish that are larger than whatever the maximum size is. And particularly in anchored nets, a lot of times those fish will be dead when they're removed. Plus, we have ITQ fisheries anyhow, where the fisherman has a set weight limit he can catch. So it, there's no point in discarding that fish is the point. So I was just wondering if um, I don't know exactly how we would modify this one, but to bring the gill net mesh, mesh into this um, would be a pretty neat way to have a single uh, motion that would cover everything. John, I think you could just try to do an amendment, see if you can get an exemption for your anchored gill nets and then move forward. I think that's the best way to proceed. Uh, right, I'm just thinking based on the motion, we're already talking about maximum size limits and going to be examining that. So this would just be to set maximum mesh limits that are uh, correspond to those maximum size limits. So it might be something we could do easily here, although I'm not really coming up with an easy way to do it. But um, perhaps if could we just add wording for right now to uh, option sets D? and E, which are the maximum size limits to perhaps um, determine the quota reductions using the uh, maximum size limits and the corresponding uh, gill net mesh sizes. John, so in the PDT memo on page seven, do you have that in front of you? There's two options. Here's an anchored gill net exemption or there is the option to allow the states to submit CE proposals requesting an exemption. You want to just choose one of those? Well, I was just thinking even with, um, you know, as I said, with an ITQ fisher, even with a drift net, if you catch something uh, larger than a, than a maximum size, the survival is going to be better than an anchor net, but if it's an ITQ, what's the point of throwing it back? I mean, why not just have the the fishermen harvest that fish? So I would just like to see that the um, that the restrictions we put in place would recognize the fact that these are different fisheries, and we're trying to get the same result with gill nets, but we're not holding them to the same standard as a hook and line fishery or a pound net or whatever. Understood. And that's what an anchored gill net exemption would do here. So the anchored gill nets would not be subject to a maximum size limit, but they would be subject to a mesh size requirement. And you need to figure out what that corresponding mesh size requirement would be. Under option um, F3, the states would submit a conservation equivalency proposal to whatever maximum size limit gets approved if that's the option that goes forward and for um, a mesh size requirement equal to for the anchored gill net fishery so i mean i think are you, or are you not even wanting to have a, a mesh size requirement you just want a full exemption no I, I, as i said they, uh, we can we can work with this um I guess in that case, what we should do is work on this one and then also have the options, option in F here to uh, look at that. I guess it would have to be a separate motion then. Do you prefer F2 or F3? 
Uh, let me read them over again. Okay. Uh, you, you, I'll, maybe you just come back to me. Let me just. All right. So we'll we'll stay with the main motion here right now, and we'll go ahead and take comments. Um, and take up the four comments. Mike, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two thoughts to help me decide. The first one is uh, based on the discussion that we had that Tony presented earlier, Justin, does, does this delay the review and the approval of the draft addendum until our next meeting so we can all have the opportunity to see the calculations that would come forth as a result of your motion or or not i guess that's my one of my questions and then mr chairman i do have a comment regarding the overall motion okay thanks mike we'll get let justin respond to that and back to you thank you mr chair it's a good question mike i i think it depends on the will of the board although tony correct me if i'm wrong if the board was willing to send this out for public comment acknowledging that that spawning potential analysis will be done those tables will be populated before the public sees it but the board doesn't need to see that before it goes to the public then i think we could vote to send it out today if the board felt like they want to see the results of that spawning potential analysis associated with those different options thinking that if they saw that they might someone might see one and decide they want to vote to take it out of the document or something i think that's really a decision for the board of whether we'd be willing to make that move to ask for the analysis, but be good with it going out to the public before we see the results or not. Back to you, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for that, Justin. <clears throat> I guess we'll make that decision later. Um, so I'll start by saying I like the first paragraph. Um, I think it accomplishes everything that I thought was, was reasonable um, to kind of break things down a little bit and get the calculations done um, for maximum size limits. <clears throat> I, I, and it's not that I'm arguing against option B. I think the com a commercial quota reduction is a reasonable request or a reasonable consideration by the board, given where we are with striped bass <clears throat> um, and the stock and the health of the stock. I just, I find some, concern in that some of the decisions we've already made here today and what is going to be analyzed is likely going to produce reduction values on the recreational fishery that are less than what we're shooting for as a target reduction. Um, and now we have an option where 14.5 percent with no consideration of anything other than that would be made on the commercial and yes because it is easy but it's easy the right way to do it the harder way to do it and the bigger bang for your buck is to deal with uh, release mortality but that's difficult so it's you know i just don't like the rationale behind let's just take 14 and a half percent from the commercial fishermen because it's easy to do um, and they're going to see themselves compared with the other sectors in a way that takes the full extent of the reduction on them, yet the recreational anglers, given the scenarios we've discussed, could find themselves falling within a different rate, within a, within a variable range. <clears throat> so I'll get to my, my point is I would prefer to see that reduced by to reduced um, up to 14.5 percent as a way of evaluating and considering um, some additional um, levels of reduction on the commercial end so I, that's what i would have preferred it to say but that's where i stand thanks all right thanks mike tony's got some clarifications to offer i'll offer for your comfort level mike that the board always has the option to do something within the range of the options that are in the document. You have zero and you have 14.5 and you got everything in between. So come time for approval, you could. I understand where you're going with what you're discussing. Um, I Something to think about as the board provides their direction to staff on 
when this document goes out um, and the spawning potential closures. Um, I know that some states have done these spawning, or not closures, the spawning potential and then what that does to your quotas. Some states have done these calculations before. I don't believe that every state has done these before. Um, there is some adjustments that we'll need to make from the last time a state did it based on new information. So is it your prerogative to just let each state do it and bring it to the public hearing as the state calculated it? Is the TC need to review what a state has calculated? Are there states that are going to need some help? Who is going to help them? Um, uh, so just keep thinking about those things and continue your discussion. All right, thanks, Tony. So we've got Dave Sikorsky followed by Robert T. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Tony. Um, that was helpful. Um, in the section of this motion that, it, that talks about option B, I think the only way that we're actually going to achieve the goal that got us here today, which is controlling out, is if we reduce from commercial landings, not commercial quotas. And if you look at the 2022 performance of the fishery in the Chesapeake Bay, and we look at it compared to 2017 levels, the addendum six, you know, where we started, um, Chesapeake Bay has had a 10%, 24%, and 15% increase in commercial quotas compared to 2017. That's table 13C. Um, I entered this meeting thinking, how do we save 986,000 fish? I don't care who saves them. How are we going to save them? If we reduce from quota, we're not saving fish. And just for a little clarity of the bay versus the ocean, based on 2022 removals, bay commercial removals account for 35% of total removals, according to the data provided. That's 1,573,732 fish. Ocean removals, I'm sorry, the total removals is that 1.5 million. Um, from the ocean total removals, 2.5 of those removals, 2.5% of those removals are commercial. So clearly, again, we have a challenge with how we're managing the Chesapeake Bay and who gets to take what and how that relates to F, because that's all that matters today. Are we reducing F? We've left some folks on the sideline to not be involved in conservation over the last three years, and Table 13C shows it plain as day for the Chesapeake Bay. You look at Table 13B. Table 13B, the only portion of that that did not achieve removals from 2017 levels was the recreational fishery in 2022. This board has already taken action to limit the recreational fishery from the 22 levels by taking emergency action. So to sum it up, if we're not reducing from landings, we're not reducing F. We have 986,000 fish to save here. And I think it's very important we look at all these sources and make sure that this addendum as it moves out addresses that addresses 986,000 fish being saved, recognizing that maybe not everybody has fish to give and some have to give a little more. That's my thoughts. I, I don't have an amendment here um, other than, you know, I've, I've spoken to it and I, I want to see what board members think. Maybe I'll take another bite. All right. Thank you, Dave. Robert T. and then Emerson Hasbrook. Uh, yes. Uh, we came here today. We're talking about dead discards and Everybody knows that's a problem. The commercial fishery has less dead discards than any other fishery that we have. The commercial fishery is uh, accountable for all the fish they got that we catch. We got tags that we tag every fish. We got fish that we have to carry to weigh-in stations in some states. So, I mean, we're, we're very accountable on every fish we caught. And taking 14.5% reduction is a hardship on the commercial fishermen. I mean, you got a lot of people who wouldn't even be able to eat a rockfish if it wasn't for the commercial fishermen because they can't afford to go catch the fish. It's it's time that you readjust this and look at this cut in quota as we are not the ones that have the high dead discards. The dead discards is what really needs to be addressed. We don't have that problem. And we're down to 10% of the fish that is being caught, and that's without the discards. 
So you need to look, take a, a careful look at this, reevaluate it, because our commercial fishery, it will really be hurt very bad. A lot will, some will probably fold up and go out of business with, with a 14 and a half percent reduction. So let's concentrate on dead discards, which is the main problem, and hopefully we can correct it. All right, thanks, Robert T. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm opposed to this motion. You know, I'm opposed to the extent um, that I have a motion to substitute. A very simple motion. So I'm, <clears throat> I move to remove option B2. That's my motion to substitute. So this essentially removes the option to require <clears throat> the quality adjustment using spawning potential analysis to account for maximum size. If I got a second, I can talk about this more. Is there a second to that motion? He's got a substitute. So one last call for a motion. Emerson made the motion. Is there a second? Seeing none, motion does not move forward. So we're back to the main motion. Oh, wait a minute. So Tony just noticed, Emerson, you got a second from Craig Pugh online. So your motion is up. I'd like to go ahead and speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, addendum two, was not intended um, to consider a commercial quota reduction, um, but to only consider a commercial maximum size. And I was the seconder on that motion uh, to develop addendum two. And I did not intend the addendum to implement a commercial quota reduction. Uh, maybe Dr. Davis thinks differently because he made the motion, but when I seconded that motion, that motion, and when I supported it, I did not intend it to implement a commercial quota reduction. Uh, further, the quota reductions presented in the draft show a greater percent reduction in the commercial quota um, than will be required um, by the recreational uh, catch reduction. Um, and, and that's uh, using the, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, with the, uh, spawning spawning potential analysis. So what's what's presented um, in the draft is uh, using that spawning potential analysis. Commercial reductions are likely to exceed um, either that 14 and a half percent or what the reductions are um, in the in the recreational fishery. Uh, so in, in the motion, all this motion also eliminates all the issues described. Um, in the PDT memo uh, relative to state-specific calculations. And I don't particularly want to take um, this addendum out to public hearing and tell the public that we don't really know what the commercial quota reductions are going to be state by state um, under the option, option A up there um, when we go through the adjustment. If we don't know what they are, um, I think it's very disingenuous for us to bring it out um, to the public and say, we'll let you know what it's going to be. I also don't want to send it out to the public without us reviewing it first, without the board reviewing what those reductions are, are going to be um, under the, the uh, spawning potential analysis. But I don't want to delay any action on this draft addendum to a future board meeting. I think we need to take action now and get this out to the public and get this thing going down the road. Um, also, we just opposed seasons, but now we want to impose a 14 and a half percent or greater reduction on the sector um, that only contributes 10 percent of the removals. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Emerson. And if Craig Pugh would like to comment a second or not, I'd like to call the question, keep us back, get us back on track if we could. Craig, um, Tony, if we can get him to unmute. Craig, do you want to comment? I think I'm with you. 
We have you. you. Got me? Okay, good. Good. Uh, thank you for for that. The I don't. I respect Tony's opinion uh, and what she said, and, and most of the time she's right. But the, but the language here says will, uh, and that's what the public's going to read. They're going to say commercial fisheries will be reduced, and they'll expect it to will be reduced. I know uh, I certainly would if that was the language intended. It doesn't say could. It doesn't say that there's, you know, from zero to 14. It says it will be reduced by that. And because of that, that's probably my main reason for the, uh, the distastefulness of, of this part of the motion. But uh, uh, so I'm in agreement with uh, Emerson and uh, maybe a few others. But uh, we are taking quite, quite the commercial hit here uh, for having 10% of the fishery. Uh, we're going to be reduced by 14.5%. Um, we're already at, uh, I think it's, uh, we're allocated about 1,200 pounds a piece, 12, 1,200 pounds a piece in the state of Delaware. So I'm looking at, uh, I don't know, John can correct me here, but that's probably pretty close to a thousand, maybe a thousand pounds. So am I, uh, am I an actual, uh, commercial fisherman or am I uh, reduced to a hobby? Uh, cause uh, you know, that's, that's core, kind of the way we felt for, for a long period of time and the degradation of our commercial industry is, uh, nothing new. And my, my little talks here are nothing new to any of you, but, uh, we just keep willing away, willing away, willing away because, because it is, because it's easy. Oh, that's easy to take away from them. We know what it is. Sure. You know what it is, but we've done a hell of a good job with trying to target our fish. So they will market well with hardly any dead discards, uh, and you know, love to show any of that uh, that actual uh, knowledge that we have, where we actually catch the fish. Uh, you know, two three days quota easy with three or four hundred yards in net. Uh, it's like fishing in a mud puddle to me. When I was a kid, we used to fish three thousand yards in net. Uh, so, you know, it's a, the degradation of our commercial fishery just keeps willing away, willing away, willing away. Is it really worth it here? Is the emergency really that big of an emergency? I'm not so sure. I'm seeing a lot of fish that are 14, 16 inches. What year class is that? Uh, seeing a, a ton of those fish that have shown up as bycatch. Uh, apparently, we've missed them. Uh, but there seems to be a lot of things that we miss at any rate. Uh, I'll be quiet. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Is there a need for a caucus before we take call the question? Yes. Okay. 30 seconds. All right. Let's call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Right, Jason. Oh. Jason, you have a question? Thank you, Jason. All right, let's call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Rhode Island, New York, Delaware. Those opposed? New Hampshire, Maine, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Abstentions. District of Columbia. No votes. Yeah, 312-1. Motion fails, 312-1. So we're back to the main motion. But so, yeah, we're going to try to address your concerns, John. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think if uh, what I'd like to put in there is from the uh, the memo option F2. So if I think that can be, I think the motion can be amended to um, um, add uh, option F2. But I I think I can modify it to just be all gill nets, not anchored, just not anchored, but just option F2 modified to be gill nets. So that would be, uh, be, 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 where would we put that again? That would be, uh, 
Want some help, John? We could put it after um, the Chesapeake Bay commercial maximum size limits and move to add um, option F2. John, so you would say, I, I, instead of saying F2, since you're changing it, because that only is specific to, okay. just say, to modify, uh, to exempt To exempt all gill gill nets. okay. For, to, to exempt gill nets from, uh, yeah, that would work. Uh, sort of with each other. Okay, so to exempt gill nets from maximum size limits. Are you going to require the mesh size? Oh, uh, to, to require, okay, to require maximum mesh sizes and exempt from maximum size limits. And exempt gill nets from maximum size limits. Yeah, yeah, right. Does that look right, John? I believe so. So we'll the the idea here is that for gill nets we'll we'll set a maximum mesh size that would correspond to the whatever size limit is chosen, and then they will be exempted from the size limit requirement. And I believe that's that says it. All right. Do we have a second to the motion, Dennis Abbott? We need. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the question for John, I mean, I think the intent here is that if the board ended up voting up the maximum size limit options, then we would look to require a maximum mesh. Like not if the board ended up either going for status quo on commercial or doing the option B 14.5% reduction. Correct. Correct, Justin. Yeah, it's only if maximum size limits are chosen. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Dennis, did you want to speak to it? No, good. I'll have two comments. Emerson. Thank you. I'm just wondering what this uh, uh, maximum mesh size is going to be based on. What what studies are we going to base that on? What information is available? We have a lot of, um, and I, I'd say this is probably true for most gillnet fisheries. We have a lot of commercial sampling data, and as I said, nothing is going to be perfect, but for example, I would say if you were going for a, you know, whatever 40 inch size limit, that maybe an eight inch mesh would be the maximum size. And that's not going to stop a, you know, a larger fish than that from getting stuck in there, but it would probably reduce the amount of striped bass that are over the maximum size that would get caught in the net. So that was a question for John. I'll go allow two comments if anybody has any. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I can certainly support a maximum mesh size if you have a maximum size limit. Um, I understand that, you know, the, although gill nets are pretty selective, you do get fish that kind of fall outside of that range. Uh, however, uh, exempting the gill net fishery you know, from that size limit, uh, I don't think is necessary. Uh, in Albemarle Sound, uh, our commercial fishery, we have a maximum gillnet mesh size that corresponds with the maximum size limit. Yes, I'm sure there's some discards, but uh, they're 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 fairly minimal. And some of those bigger fish that, that do get caught, you know, in, in that are bigger that are in that mesh size tend not to be gilled and can be released, um, especially if the water's cold. Uh, yes, there's a discard mortality rate, but it's not 100%. So um, I'm opposed to this. Um, I think, you know, I, I just, I think it's just um, adding more complexity uh, and to, to the to the uh, addendum. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. John, you get the last word. I just wanted to uh, respond to Chris that um, I, I certainly understand what you're saying, Chris, but we're talking about ITQ fisheries here too. So it's not like these, these uh, striped bass are not being accounted for and the other part of it is is that uh we did a, an extensive bit of uh, looking at discard mortality from anchored gill nets in the early 2000s the fishery was different then it was targeting smaller fish but uh 
when a net is set for 24 hours and let's say the striped bass gets caught in there an hour after that net is set, that's a dead discard. I mean, there's no way that striped bass is surviving 23 hours in an anchored net with strong currents that we have. So that's part of the rationale here. And, you know, as I said, I just think overall that having seen a lot of this, done a lot of work with discard mortality from gill nets that, uh, especially where we have an ITQ, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. All right, thanks, John. And since you were just responding to Chris, we still have that one comment. And Cherie, you get it. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had more of a question for John. Um, you're increasing a mesh size, and forgive me, I'm just I'm not familiar with with your area. What is that going to do for um, ESA bycatch? Sturgeon, for example. Uh, we do have some sturgeon bycatch in the, the, the gillnet fishery, very small amount. In fact, before it was listed as ESA, we had good cooperation in getting actual numbers. Uh, the good thing we have seen in the years where we were able to get cooperation is that uh, discard mortality from sturgeon, even in anchored nets, is very low. They are very tough in, in those nets. All right, let's try a 30 second caucus and we'll call the question. All right, let's go ahead and call the question. Do I need to read this into the room? All right, all those in favor of the amended motion, raise your hand, please. New Hampshire, Maine, Delaware, Virginia, Pennsylvania, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Potomac River Fisheries Commission. All those opposed? Maryland, North Carolina, New York. Abstentions? District of Columbia. No votes. What do you got? 12-3-1. All right, the motion passes 12-3-1. We'll have to blend the language now, I guess, for the. Just give her one second to do that, and we should read this motion into the record. All right, we'll just read this into the record before we call the question. Move to remove option sets B and C from section 3.2.1, options for implementing a commercial maximum size limit. From somebody? Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. From draft addendum two, task the PDT with conducting spawning potential analysis to determine quota reductions using 2022 as a starting point, associated with each option in options sets D, ocean commercial maximum size limits, and E, Chesapeake Bay commercial maximum size limits, add an option to require maximum mesh sizes for gill nets and exempt them from maximum size limits. Add a new option set to section 3.2.1, containing the following options for reductions to commercial quotas. Option A, status quo, all commercial fisheries maintain 2017 size limits or addendum six approved CE plans and amendment seven quotas and addendum six approved CE adjusted quotas. Option B, commercial quota reductions. Quotas for all commercial fisheries would be reduced by 14.5% from 2022 commercial quotas including quotas adjusted through approved Addendum 6 CE plans. And we, Pat, do you have a question? Yeah, I've had my hand raised for a while. I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Davis would consider a friendly amendment. Um, Michael Luisi and Craig Pugh both brought up uh, the 14.5% reduction in quota. Can we change that to reduced up to 14.5 percent 
Yeah, Pat, um, be advised it's property of the board. You can't do a friendly. Okay. So. Well, do you I have to make can it? Amend. You can I'd amend. I'd like it. to amend. So read option B is uh, commercial quota reductions. Quota for all commercial fisheries would be reduced up to 14.5% from the 2022 commercial quotas. Let's just give it a moment so we can get the exact language up. Does that look right, Pat? Yes, it does. And if you want me to explain, I think it's pretty. I mean, I thought Craig and I thought Craig did the best job. He said by putting it out there is. It, let me get. Let me get a second first. Okay. Ray Ray King, go ahead, Pat. I was just going to say what <clears throat> Mr. Pugh said by putting it out is it's you know the way it was written it will be 14.5, and I think we should consider anything up, you know, below and up to 14.5 percent. Ray, any thoughts? Okay, you're good. Okay. So we have Eric Reed online. Go ahead, Eric. You have a comment on this motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciate Mr. Gear recognizing that, that it, it's a toxic motion as it sits. I just want to make sure, I mean, personally, I would rather say no more than 14.5%, but I, I guess I can live with up to. But I want to be clear that the rationale will, or the explanation of the, these two options will plainly state that the range between status quo and 14.5% is in play, not either nothing or all. So as long as uh, Ms. Kearns will you know, help me out with that in the document, I would be fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Any other comments? All right, 30 second caucus, we'll vote. All right, thank you, John. Let's make it uh, two minutes. All right, we will go ahead and call the question on the amended motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. New Hampshire, Maine, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, NOAA, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Potomac River Fisheries Commission. All those opposed? Abstentions? District of Columbia. Null votes. Motion passes 15-01. So now we'll modify the language on the screen. And we have another board member, Dave Skorsky, you'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion, uh, move to Trying to follow the moving ch the changes here. Um, as this gets clarified here, you've, have, are you going to replace by 14.5% with up to in? Okay. So you all heard me talk about my concerns about folks getting left in, in supporting conservation and saving some of these 986,000 fish we need to save. I think it will be a healthy exercise to add an additional option which will allow us to look at reductions from landings, not just quota for 2022. So I would move to add an option, option C, for commercial landings reductions. Landings for all commercial fisheries would be reduced up to 14.5% from 2022 commercial landings, including those which fish under quotas adjusted for the approved addendum six CE plans. We'll get that up on the board and then look for a second then. Give us a moment.
Okay, Dave, just to check off, does that language match up with what you're thinking? Yes. All right, thank you. Do we have a second to this motion? Dr. Armstrong has second the motion, so we have it up on the board. Go ahead, Dave, you want to speak to this motion? No, I've spoken to it enough this afternoon. I just think it's a good, good um, opportunity to see what the public thinks about quotas versus landings so we can save some fish and reduce removals. All right, thanks. Mike, any co extra comments? Are there any comments on the motion? Go ahead, Megan. I'm stealing this comment because I heard it on the side of the table, but uh, we have two states that had overages in 2022. Um, so it'd be helpful to know, are we reducing 14.5% from the landings or from what their quota was? I would think it would be smarter to go from quota in that case. Obviously, the analysis that is provided would show that you're not saving as many fish when you're doing it from an overage. Um, so in those cases, you know, there's assuming payback and all that other stuff. So um, ultimately, this has given us two options to look at recognizing that anomaly. So I help. <laughs> I think we can hear that it's noted on the record that any state with an overage, it would not include fish from in the overage amount. Thank you, Tony. That is my intent. All right, we have comments for Robert T. and then Chris Bat Savage. Uh, yes, this this goes back where you know a lot of times we don't catch our quota, but yet yet we can't roll it over to the next year. So that covers where the landings and stuff is at. I'm I'm not in favor of this. Uh, I think it's you know whatever the quota is. Are you going to let us to uh, say if we don't catch it? Are you going to allow us to do it, or is it going to be a credit to us? Because in many years that we haven't caught our quota, so it's uh, it's something that you have to think about how, what way the quota is going, and you know if you're not catching it, and uh, some people don't catch it because they can say I'm I'm just not fishing this year. I'm doing better crabbing or oystering or fishing or whatever it may be, you know, because a lot of them have some small quotas. But uh, I I think this is overkill. All right, thank you, Robert T. Chris. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just uh, trying to get some clarity um, on this uh, motion to amend. Uh, so is the reduction in landings at the state level uh, for each state? Because, you know, think about North Carolina, which hasn't landed any fish. Uh, that would have to zero out our quota. Um, this is trying to get a better understanding of, of how the how the math would work under under this option. The way the motion is read, your your quota would become zero. Other comments? All right, if we're ready to call the question, we'll go ahead and caucus. One minute? Two? One minute. Okay. Two? One minute. Okay. It's getting it's starting to get fuzzy here. All right, we'll go ahead and call the question on the amended motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania. Sorry about that. All those opposed? Maine, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Delaware, <laughs> New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Abstentions. District of Columbia, NOAA Fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service. No votes. Motion fails, three, 10, three. So we are back to the main motion, right? Is there any more, any more deliberation or discussion on this particular? We're back to the main motion. Anything, any other last comments before we take a vote? Is there a need to caucus?
Doesn't look like it, so we'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Let me put it another way. Does anybody object to this motion? <laughs> let's try that. Oh, okay, let's. we're going to vote it up and down then. Sorry, let's try it again. Everybody in favor, please raise your hand. New Hampshire, Maine, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, NOAA Fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Potomac River Fisheries Commission. All those opposed? New York. Abstentions? District of Columbia. No votes. Motion passes 14-1-1. So I'd ask at this time, or um, we were focused on the ocean options. We had done the rec options. I guess any 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 options that folks want to put up, any motions. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to add into the document the options described at the bottom of page nine of the PDT memo related to flaying at sea. Basically, just make a motion to add option A and option B as written there verbatim into the document. Uh, I apologize, I don't have that prepared ahead of time. No. Okay, let's see if we can get that up, Justin, and we'll let you check off on it. Justin, does that, meet, does that language meet your... Okay. Do we have a second to that motion? Dr. Armstrong. Uh, Justin, you want to go ahead and... Your rationale. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief. I think we heard some discussion earlier. I, I, I do think it creates a enforcement loophole when states allow flaying of striped bass at sea. It's become even more pronounced now with our narrow slot limit. So I think it makes sense for the board to require states to, you know, implement common sense language around flaying at sea. Thanks, Justin. Mike, any comments? No, it's pretty simple with a, a slot size this small. Um, it, it really needs to be verifiable. All right. Any comments on this motion? Roy. Mr. Chairman, regarding Justin's motion, I was wondering, um, we have a, a regulation in Delaware where you can't alter the size of the fish. Um, one year, many years ago, we had a problem with the fishermen um, taking a scissor, pair of scissors to the tails of fish to bring them under the maximum size limit. I, I think that was part of Justin's intent here, but it doesn't say. It just talks about filleting. So I would say altering the length of the fish in, in any way um, ought to be encompassed with this particular motion. Roy, did you want to amend it then, the motion? If they bring that motion back up, I can. Roy, this wasn't discussed by the PDT, so I just need a second. <laughs> um, if you just added some language in there or, or otherwise alter the length of the fish in any way prior to landing. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly appreciate Roy's concerns and I've had similar discussions with our law enforcement. The challenge there is that the, the options as worded in the document sort of there's a status quo option and then there's an option that compels states that that allow at sea flaying currently to do certain things which i read as saying that if a state does not currently allow at sea flaying there's no requirement in here for them to do anything so i don't think this is a good vehicle to sort of require states to implement language across the board that they don't currently have I'm not saying I'm not open to like another motion or an amendment, but um, 
I don't think there's an easy way to modify this language in the PDT memo to accomplish what Roy is looking to do. And while staff is um, still looking at this, uh, Sheree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe that the language New Hampshire uses is with head and tail intact. That would work. So is the board asking for a requirement for state regulations then to say with head and tail intact? I'm trying to figure out, since we did not, the PDT did not review what every state's regulations were relative to this issue. I don't know how prom if it is an issue, if it's not an issue um, for other states. It, so it's difficult for me to figure out how to apply it to the document. We could do a review of state's regulations and then if there are states that don't have anything um, related to So if we don't, if state, so when we do the review, if there are issues with states not having language surrounding keeping the head and tail intact or something similar to that effect, then we could add something to the document. But if there is, those that language is already covered by all the states, then I don't think it's something we need to add to the document. Again, we will need to do that review of every state's language to see if it's necessary or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, or or we could consider a a motion to uh, make it illegal to alter the size of a fish once reduced to harvest until it until basically until you reach the dock. Otherwise, I can almost guarantee that. Some um, some fishermen will be altering the size of the fish at sea with a pair of scissors or whatever. Um, Bob, you have some thoughts? As long as there is a maximum size limit. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, th I think this is two separate issues. One is filleting at sea and retaining the rack and all these other issues. And the other is you have a whole fish that hasn't been filleted, but someone's just sort of trimmed a half inch off the tail or whatever it might be. So I, I would almost suggest, you know, handle this motion that deals with flaying at sea and then if there's still interest in this say you know add an, an option to the you know another motion that would add an option to the document that prevent states are required to prevent the or implement regulations that prevent the alteration of the length of fish something like that so just keep them separate and keep them hopefully simple so vote up this motion and have roy bring another one forward okay Roy, if that meets your um, satisfaction, we'll go ahead and vote this one up, and then you can you can offer up um, your own motion. G uh, Jason, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick, it, you know, I, I'm totally supportive uh, of this, and and we've been we've tried this a couple of times in Rhode Island. So I, I just wanted to mention, you know, it makes total sense for fisheries management. We then run afoul of other agencies, Department of Health and water resources. And um, so it, it gets complicated to um, make this work. So I just wanted to offer that so people can think about those aspects um, of this, but generally I'm supportive for all of the reasons uh, that the makers of the motion mentioned. All right, thank you, Jason. Any last comments before we vote on the motion? All right, need a caucus? No. Oh, okay. How about let's try the easy way. Is there any opposition to this motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by consent. And Roy, I think we can come back to you if you'd like to uh, offer up a motion related to the concerns you had. I'm sort of working on the fly here. Can you give me another minute? Thank you. Well, in the interest of time, let me just try to reach out and look at the board. Um, are there going to be other motions that folks want to put on the table? John? Thank you, Mr. I don't know if it 
it would be a motion at this point. I just want to go more detail on the commercial tagging programs. I know with the FMP review, we've asked LEC to look at this again. Uh, back when Addendum 3 was passed, the LEC strongly recommended that tagging be at the point of harvest. Um, for this addendum, I don't know if we want to put that out there as an option just for the public consideration. I would, uh, I, I, if we want to wait, I guess that would have to wait for a, a second addendum, another addendum before we go to that. We did just test the PRT to review the tagging program. So we could get the results of that and then in the future make a change in the document. But that does not preclude you from adding it to this very simple addendum. <laughs> I'm just putting well, that back out there since that's what you all well, called said, it in May. <laughs> yeah, what the hell, it's already 640, right? So. <laughs> Just, uh, just for the, the sake of allowing the public to consider all the options that have been considered, uh, I would like to see that um, we just put an option in there to require commercial tagging at the point of harvest. And I, I'd like the double tagging in there, which uh, many states do. So a point of harvest and uh, at the dealer way station also, point of sale. John, do you have that written down? I don't, but I can. Can you just, while, while we're dealing with Roy's, can you yeah, type that up Yeah, I will do so. And John, just while you're thinking about it, the, it was a notion that the PDT sort of brought up, but it is not fully explored. It doesn't have a background. It does not have justification. So I'll need some direction on In that what case, you're looking to yeah. achieve. Why don't we wait then until the, we're going to get a full report Right, so I'll wait till that point. Thanks. Thanks. Go ahead, Roy. With the assistance of staff, we have a motion up there. Mr. Chair, would you like me to read the motion? Please. Move to add an option to the addendum that prevents the alteration of the length of a striped bass prior to landing at the dock. Do we have a second to the motion? Dennis Abbott. Go ahead, Roy, would you like to speak to your motion? I think I've sufficiently covered the background on that. Dennis, any other thoughts? All good. Any comments on the motion? Justin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as I see this, essentially, if this got voted up, states, if this option was voted up at final action in the addendum, states would have to, that don't currently have regulatory language on the books addressing this, would have to craft that language, implement it, and then during you know FMP review, we determine if that language was in compliance or not. So it would sort of fall back on the states to develop language to meet this mandate and or fall on the plan review team to determine whether language states have on the books meets the intent. I, um, I'm texting with Nicole, who is <laughs> instrumental in helping us put this document together. And I think we have to be very careful about how this is understood this is not about filleting it's just about altering the fish itself and there's some states have some language about it but sometimes it's related to the filleting sometimes it's not related to the filleting it was a little bit controversial amongst the pdt members and so we on purpose left this language out i think that's what nicole is texting to me i don't know if nicola has a different remembrance of this. And if you do, Nicola, come to the table. Um. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I, I just don't think the PDT really, I think your first answer was correct, that the PDT did not um, query the states for this per type of particular language. Um, I know in Massachusetts we already have language that prevents any mutilation of a fish so that it can't be measured. Um, so I just I don't know that this is needed, nor did the, the PDT really investigate it yet. Thanks, Nicola. Adam. 
So I appreciate the intent of this motion, but I'm going to have to be opposed to it. I, I think that there's a lot of language that states have regarding mutilation of fish already that covers this in many cases. Uh, I think this is something that could be covered somewhere down the road. Uh, I, a regular practice in the recreational fishery is to bleed fish. Okay, so what happens when you bleed a fish and it results in an eighth inch, a sixteenth of an inch of shrinkage? Does that now open the door for saying, well, you did something that altered the length of the fish? What happens when you stick it in a cooler on ice and throw something else in there? And that winds up breaking part of a tail. Again, I appreciate the intent. This is the type of thing that I think is just far too vague. Uh, I think this is a very minor problem in the scope of what we're trying to address in the big picture here today. And I think this should be put off to somewhere else down the road where it can be given some more development and thought what the best way forward is. But again, I appreciate the intent here. All right, thanks, Adam. Any last comments? Joe. Joe and then Megan. So I just, there's, at least nine states that allow filleting. This isn't preventing filleting. The vast majority of those require racks, so it would be kind of to the rack. Okay. Yeah, Megan. I was just gonna say I'm kind of having flashbacks here. I think it was circle hook language where we had to define bait and are uh, putting it back. We had certain language and. I think I think it's a great idea. I think it needs LEC input. I think this needs PDT development. I would oppose it now, but say let's put it on the burner for a subsequent conversation. All right, Megan. So thank you very much. So let's uh, any need to caucus? Don't see any heads nodding. So we're going to go ahead and call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. New Hampshire, Delaware, Rhode Island. All those opposed? Maine, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, and Maryland. Any abstentions? District of Columbia, no fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service. No votes. What's our file on that? Sorry, motion fails 310 with three abstentions. So I'm going to ask one more time. Any more motions for draft addendum two to amendment seven? Justin. I'd like to make a motion that we have no more motions this evening. <laughs> Do I have a second? <laughs> okay, I think we got your point, Dennis. Uh, uh, go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I know the hour is getting late here, but both Mike and Tony at different junctures raised the issue of, you know, whether we're going to send this out for public comment after this meeting or whether the board wants to come back at a subsequent meeting and see the results of the spawning potential analysis that we decided to do under the motion that got voted up in the commercial section. There's also the related issue you brought up, Tony, of what level of TC review or not do we want of the work that's done on that spawning potential analysis, which I think relates to that question. So um, I do think we have to deal with that issue before we walk away. Those were gonna be my questions back to the board again before you can have one last motion to take this out to public comment or not. <laughs> Um, but we do need to resolve this, and that is the will of this board. Go ahead, Doug. I would propose that uh, um, the spawning potential calculations be run by the TC, but it doesn't need to be brought back to the board. That's my proposal. So 
I think that if we do that, um, we can, it's going to shift the time frame. I will not, if we have the TC review these, which is a, a potentially a good thing to do in particular, since I, I'm not sure every state has done these before, um, and the TC reviews them, we would not meet the annual meeting time frame just because the annual meeting is much earlier this year and I just don't think we'll have enough time. So we would shift to have a special meeting of the board sometime after the annual meeting in the fall and we'll, you know, obviously we'll move this as quickly as we can um, and approve still this year. I don't know in terms of time frames what that means for everybody's um, implementation dates and like how quickly states can turn all of their measures over. We haven't really discussed that yet as a board. We typically don't do that until we approve the document. Adam. I can't speak for the workloads, but it would be possible to turn some of that around and instead have a meeting between now and the annual meeting to send this out for public comment, which could potentially then allow us to take final action at the annual meeting. So, Adam, the problem is, is wait, are you saying not to not put the spawning potential information in the document? So I believe the timeline you put together was that somewhere down the road, not at the annual meeting, is when we would take final action. So what I'm proposing is there, whatever it is that we need to do that would delay that final action, is there the possibility to do that work that would delay sending this out for public comment so we could get the work done? but still take final action on this document in person. Because I, I don't believe that this document at this point is ripe for some virtual meeting later this fall, quite frankly. Whenever this document gets final action, I believe at this point it warrants an in-person meeting. So whether that's one of our regular scheduled meetings, you know, I, I just don't want to see this get pushed to well, we're just going to do it by, hey, we've done a lot of great things via webinar, and I know we've taken on some very difficult things, but now that we don't have to do it that way, let's not make that mistake. So that's what I'm suggesting. If there was some way that we could delay, I would rather see this go out for public comment via some virtual meeting if we just need more time. That's all I'm putting out there. The problem is, Adam, is having time for the TC to review the spawning impacts to the quotas and the amount of time from that moment to the annual meeting will be very short. I don't think I can get the document out, comments counted, summarized, and finished before the board meeting doing Emily's job and my job at the same time. Mike, so to Katie, is there's a standard methodology to do this, right? And all the states should be capable of doing it. I mean, not to toot our horn, but Gary Nelson has already done it for us. <laughs> I mean, not every state has a Gary Nelson, uh, which well, is an issue well, that we will be coming back to later this meeting, not to spoil yeah. anything. Um, so we are adding. Um, in addition to all of those commercial options, it sounds like the board wants numbers for the reductions for all of the new recreational options that we have added that were not part of this original document. So some of that has been done, some of that has not been done. How are we going to combine these different percent reductions across these different where we're picking and choosing from different options that may or may not meet the correct option. So we have added a lot of work on the technical side in addition to the SPR calculations that will be needed to, that the TC, the PDT, whoever is going to be doing this work um, needs to do and then have reviewed and then go into the document as well as all of these other options we have added 
before um, and it has to be out for a specific amount of time we have to have time afterwards to compile the comments and give, get it to you by materials i'm assuming nobody wants this supplemental um, so i think the issue is really the short turnaround between this meeting and annual meeting and the amount of changes and new analysis we have added to this document um, is going to make it very difficult So, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like we have a choice unless we want to forego some analysis. You can forego having the percent reduction that any of the measures achieve in the document and forego mm -hmm. what it does to the quotas in the document. You can just have the options straight up with not telling the public how it impacts F or the probability of achieving F. Go ahead, Bob. I'll give it a try. What 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 could happen? Um, you know, one option would be the the technical folks and the PDT do all the work as quick as they can, and maybe we'll go back and think about how long that'll take, and then we'll have a virtual meeting sometime before the annual meeting for everybody to look at the document and see, make sure everything the math makes sense and everybody's seeing the numbers relative to commercial quotas and other things. And then um, we've the budget that was approved at the last meeting actually has a contingency fund in it. So we could, if the board wanted to, get together in person sometime in November or early December. We've got some council meetings in there that are that are gonna be we'll have to work around, but we could do a face to face meeting, one day meeting um, of this board in, you know, late fall uh, to to actually get together as Adam's suggesting rather than trying to do this virtually. So we have the resources to do that. We just have to decide if the board members have the time to do that and fly in somewhere. And you know, one option is we do it at the beginning or the end of one of the other council meetings where a third of the or half of this board almost will be in that place anyway. So there's maybe some creative ways to do things here that aren't aren't too bad that you know we can still achieve that public transparency of a of an in-person meeting. Um, and allow the technical folks the time they need, not really jam them up trying to hurry through things. And the other reality is we're going to have, I don't know, 10, 12 hearings on this most likely. So, you know, that's going to take a while to, to have all those hearings and compile that. So I think we, you know, in the seven months that we have left in this year, we can probably, or five months that we have left in this year, we can figure it out. We just need to, you know, do some staff work and figure that out or, or propose some dates. Yeah, thanks, Bob, for trying to try to work through that with us. And I think the comment that worried me the most was Tony trying to do her job and Emily's job at the same time. So uh, that, did, that doesn't sound good. Um, Mike, I think you had a comment, didn't you? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <clears throat> so I've got, I have similar concerns um, that have been expressed already around the table about not only an in-person meeting, which I feel this type of discussion needs to be an in-person meeting. I'm, and maybe I'm being a little selfish. I'm concerned about myself getting asked questions that I have no answers to because we literally took a document and stripped it down and added new calculations and added this and added that. There's so much, there's nothing I can refer to anymore really when our stakeholders start asking questions tomorrow what does this mean for us and so i know that a lot of you are in that similar position where people are going to want to know what is in store and i don't know what to tell them i'd rather have my eyes on something and be able to see some work by the technical committee and the pdt before we kick this into the public arena just so i can be prepared and our agent our agency can be prepared to address concerns uh, without even having an opportunity to put my eyes on anything. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Marty. We, once we have a revised version of the document, we could do a virtual meeting to approve the document for public comment if that is to the satisfaction of this board. And then the, we would be able to then adjust potentially use this um, additional funds to meet in person um, to take final action and all of these things would occur outside of the annual meeting. 
on the front end and the back end of the annual meeting. <laughs> All right, thanks, Tony. Roy. Mr. Chairman, I don't understand the urgency in, in this, uh, getting this addendum um, implemented under this compressed time frame. I mean, we took we took action earlier today to extend the emergency size limits for a year effective October 28, 2023, um, or until the implementation of Addendum 2. So why are we hurrying the implementation of Addendum 2 uh, to the point of requiring a separate in-person meeting when we could simply push it back one meeting cycle and get everything accomplished that we that we feel is necessary. Thank you. Roy, we can do that, push it back one meeting cycle, um, and then we would approve the document in January um, and states would implement measures hopefully by um, March, April. Uh, and I guess between now and the annual meeting, uh, states could uh, let me know if we did push back what that time frame would look, you know, if that's a realistic time frame for them. Uh, obviously, uh, recreational measures, there's no conservation equivalency associated with those. The only thing that you potentially could do some conservation equivalency with is the commercial, the commercial measures, um, depending on which options get approved. Um, so implementation plans should be pretty simple. Fingers crossed. I should never say these things out loud. <laughs> um, Adam. And just to build on Roy's comments, given what we've stripped this document down to, that the ocean options mimic that emergency action that was extended for a year that all the states already have in place, there's limited thing the, the possibility for the mode split so we're, we're down to a very small set of things that have to change anyway so i i echo roy's comments about that i think that takes the rush off doing both of this in person sending it out at the annual meeting and then final action in january i think makes the most sense for everyone based on what i've heard and the limited scope of what we now have in this document for changes from what's already in place. I think the one thing that we need to pay particular attention to and the states need to keep in mind is that if your commercial quotas do change, you need to be able to change those commercial quotas in 2024. Dennis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with what Bob said. I agree with what the gentleman across the way said. I agree with what Roy said, but I think the importance of doing this addendum to correct shouldn't we shouldn't be putting time limitations on it as Roy said we have time in years past I can recall other amendments and addendums and striped bass that required in-person meetings and if it's necessary for us to get together we can find the funding for it as necessary but we should do this right and we should do this in it in due time Thanks, Dennis. Um, and if I could be so bold, ask Tony and Katie and maybe Bob too, what, what is the sweet spot for trying to find the, the nexus between giving staff enough time to do this properly um, and also allowing us, is, is, there, is there a sweet spot? I mean, everybody seems to agree a number of different options can work, but I'd kind of like to know from the staff's perspective, which, what's your comfort level? I mean, I think the most, I'm not gonna, about to call it relaxed, but the most workable solution is the, you know, redo the document between now and October and have hearings between October and the winter meeting, winter meeting final approval. You know, that's the most workable for us. We're a person down obviously with uh, Emily on maternity leave and, um, you know, that that's the most workable. But if the board's in a big hurry, to get something done before the end of this calendar year so they can start implementing earlier in 24, 
we can probably find a way to compress it and make it happen with a virtual meeting between now and the annual meeting and an in-person meeting sometime in late November, early December timeframe. Uh, but again, the I think the the less stressful option for staff would be, you know, next two regularly scheduled quarterly meetings. We the board gets another look at the document in October, has public comment after that, final approval in, at the winter meeting. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Is there anyone on the board that w would have an issue with what Bob just su suggested, just to try to get some consensus on this? Doug? I wouldn't have an issue as long as all the uh, state directors here that have to implement commercial quota changes uh, in, in 2024 are able to do that effectively, get it done in 2024 if we approve it in January. I understood, Doug, and, and that's why I guess Bob said that if we have an issue there, he can compress that. So, Mike, you had you had a thought? <clears throat> yeah, to that point, um, even if we were to do the more speedy turnaround with a final implement, the final decisions made at the mid to end of October, we will still be challenged uh, with our commercial fishery not just on the coast, but more so even in the Bay, given the volume of individuals and the ITQs that they have, we're gonna be strapped to get tags distributed and quota quotas distributed in time. A January final action will eliminate 24 from us being able to modify quotas because we send it all through with our tagging program and it all goes out prior to the start of the season, because the, the season starts on January 1. So we'll be in full swing come mid-October, and just I want to put it out there that the expectation would hopefully be that if this is pushed into January, I'll there will be nothing I can do. It would be very difficult. It would, it would almost be impossible to try to pull quota back after it's been distributed. And we don't have the resources to do multiple rounds of quota distribution. Gotcha. Thanks, Mike. Pat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think all the Bay States are going to be in that similar situation. Um, it's going to be really difficult commercially to get something done. You know, we may have to have two implementation dates, one for commercial, one for recreational. That's that's the only thing I would suggest. Are there other jurisdictions that would have similar challenges, John? Yeah, we're we're a much smaller scale, but we open in February, and I mean, we now have the flexibility. I think we could make the changes, but the fishery would probably be underway if we didn't, you know, finalize this till early February. How about the Northeast, Rhode Island, Mass? You know, any issues on your end? Others? Um, Yeah, so I, you know, speaking for Rhode Island, um, it it would be tight, but you know, the fish, um, the time period that Tony mentioned, you know, this sort of April time period, that's when the fish start showing up. So um, we probably could, it'd be tight, but we could probably um, make it work. Thanks, Jay. Any other comments on this? Um, I'm going to somehow figure out which which is the best way to go here. It sounds like it's going to be challenging almost any way we we go. Um, but given the staff limitations, I, it might be just the way I'm hearing it. But it sounds like maybe the way Bob you laid it out with coming to the winter meeting. But I, I guess the the trade off is how do we deal with the if we don't know until the end of January, how do we deal with the implementation, on, especially on the commercial side? You either, uh, go ahead, Megan. I mean, given what I'm hearing, I, at this point, would advocate for a webinar to review it and approve it for public comment, and then a special in-person meeting sometime in the fall after public hearings to approve it. I just want to clarify that that fall webinar potentially could be like mid-November, and I want to hear from the Bay States 
is mid-November too late to change your quotas for current? Do you have the same? So Mike, if the final action is taken in probably mid-November, can you implement a change in your commercial quota at that point? I'm seeing no from Virginia, no from Maryland. And an unsure from Delaware. Well, logistic, it's it's just tough. I'm even just getting the tags in time. I understand tags have to go out before the start of the fishery. So either way, we are not going to make it for those states. Do you still feel the same way, Megan? Uh, I, yeah, it's a no-win situation here. So, I... Bob, it's kind of late. I may overstep my bounds, but we'll see. You know, if if the if the base states say that realistically they can't get it done regardless of the schedule, and you know the the notion of two different compliance or implementation dates has already come up and. The discussion earlier was saying, you know, the the commercial fishery is only 10% of the mortality anyway. You know, it is are we really trying to to push things along and maybe hurry things up that we may not end up with a, a good product? And if the recreational measures are put in in 24 and and commercial in 25 potentially, you know, is that does that give a lot of heartburn around the table? I guess is the question. I'm not suggesting it's a good idea or bad idea. It's just that seems to be one of the, the potential outcomes that, that could come out of this conversation. Dr. Armstrong, if I can, so is it the SPR stuff that's really going to be the slowdown? I think it's the SPR stuff. It's the, the all the addition, like the changes in the maximum size limits for for the bay and what those calculate to be. I don't, yeah. I think we have some of them, but I don't think we have all of them done. Um, and then what do all of these things combine do to the overall calculation? So there's several things. And don't forget that our TC members at the same time are working on the stock assessment. Many of these TC members are working on other stock assessments that are ongoing and I'm trying not to um, have Katie murder me when I ask her thousands of questions every day because I am not Emily. <laughs> um, but so all of those things would take time. Doug. So it, it it's. Um becoming quite evident that we're going to have to have a dual implementation dates. And is that going to affect the percentage calculations uh, of the cumulative uh, impact? Because, <laughs> you know, I want this to be done right. You know, I wish it would be in place in 2024, but, you know, I understand the logistics of, of, of putting in commercial fishing regulations. I certainly, I understand this, that's going to be very difficult for them, but I think we might have to uh, prepare the public for for that as a possibility, given the time frame that we're going to have to be with. You know, if we have to prove it in February and, and implement commercial in 2025, better than we are at now. And Katie and I can talk later about what is the best way to present the information you know some options have more solid understanding of what a reduction would be than others so you know we will work on that and provide that information in the document if we can with the knowledge that there might be two implementation dates or the probability of achieving a goal correct
you can repeat them. All right, so I think what we're hearing up at the front here is we're at the closest we're going to get to some consensus is the annual meeting and then final approval at the winter meeting. And the hearings would occur between, between, between the two. Time. And that's, it sounds like that's the best we can do. Can everybody live with that? Okay. I, it, does that suffice for the will of the board? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do we need to do to put a bow when there's a, a, mo a final motion? There would, uh, we won't take a final action or not final action. We will not take action to approve the document for public hearing since several members of the board expressed that they wanted to see the, uh, mm -hmm. the document prior to doing that. So we will bring that back to the board. And if I can get it in October and, um, if it is of interest of the board, we can try to get it done before the meeting. We will not sit on our laurels and try to get it out to you all so you can explore it for longer if that is something that you all would like to see or not. But we'll do our best. So then we won't approve that to go to public hearing until the annual meeting. So at this point, we don't, we, we're at other business, I suppose. Is that right? We are. I don't think we have any. I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love this <laughs> because I'm the champion for the survey. So I'm going to say it again, oh, right? That you know, I have to, Tony, I have to. And Rick Jacobson delayed his flight. And, and so uh, he, you're smiling, Rick. So it's all good. It's all good. So um, I'd like to bring up, um, I'm a champion, as you all know, for the winter tagging survey, uh, which has been in place for over 30 years. And we've been patching funding together from year to year for that. And most recently, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been um, is putting up the funds for that. And so at this point, as best I know, we don't have funds for the coming winter. And I'm, my worry was I didn't want to let it slip to the annual meeting before we talked about it. And we'd be right on the cusp. So I don't think there's really anything to discuss. I, I would just say, um, and Rick, maybe I will ask you if you don't mind um, now that your flight's delayed. Do you mind saying just a word or two about you know where fish and wildlife is and it, it sounds like it's 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 iffy at best and, pro and maybe not probable that you'll have funding this year is that correct well we certainly understand the uh, importance of the survey um, both for purposes of how long it's been in place the information it provides <clears throat> and that there are some changes going on that it would be best to be able to monitor those changes through time um, my crystal ball is a little fuzzy on what exactly the federal budgets are going to be for fiscal year 24. All indications are it's going to be a rocky road. Uh, that's one question. That's one issue. Another issue is with inflationary costs, uh, the costs of the survey have been going up each year. The contributing um, sources of funds have not been going up commensurate with those. So the service, in spite of a declining budget over the last several years, uh, has had to bear an increasing portion of those costs. Now, that said, I'm reasonably confident we can manage uh, the winter of 24 survey. Uh, that, that presupposes we're under a continuing resolution or something close to a level budget this year. Um, if that doesn't play out and there is a substantial reduction, then we do have to refigure how we're going to do it. I have even greater concerns moving beyond fiscal year 24. And we're really going to have to have some sort of relief in order to continue the project. Yeah, thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. So um, so maybe it's a little bit more than iffy. Maybe, maybe it could still happen, but it's contingent on a few things, um, you know, like you said, with a continuing resolution. So I, I don't really have anything else unless, oh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Just to follow up on on Rick's comments, you know, we didn't we just decided the board didn't want to spend the contingency money on a meeting. Um, so, um, but you know, that doesn't help with the twenty four and beyond or the beyond twenty four problem. But last year, I think the ASMC chipped in I don't know a few thousand dollars for travel or extra fuel costs or something. And maybe Rick and I just talk as as the year unfolds and see what he has, see what we have, and we can make something work. I think you know it's. Um, one of the tricky parts of some of our money is it's not 
approved for on the water activities. So we 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 may have to, but we could have covered some travel and maybe they charter the boat. I don't. We'll figure something out. But I think between the two of us and and um, you know budgets and and residual funds and that sort of thing, we can probably figure it out for this year. But but. 20 or you know 25 and beyond is is, is I agree 100% with Rick we got to figure that out and I'm not sure where that money comes from but we've been doing this year by year for 30 years now so we'll just we'll keep it up and see how it goes well thank you Bob and thank you Rick for that um, and a, a lot of people are familiar with that survey and I remember going out on it in the early 90s on the Oregon too and the Hart Award winner that you all know a lot of you know Bill Cole and I'll never forget him saying um, if we had to actually phone Annapolis to get more tags because they encountered so many striped bass and Bill Cole said, my God, they're really back. And uh, now here we are in 2023 and we're in a tough spot with striped bass. So it, it's, you know, there's a little bit of sentimentality that's kind of clouding me, but I'm a, I've been a pretty big champion for it. So I hate to, to bother and nag Rick and Bob about this because I'm always nipping at your heels and saying there's a way to do it. But if anybody thinks in their travels of any, any way we can fund this thing, more stably going forward. It, you know, I think it would be worthwhile and I appreciate it. Um, so with that, I'd seek a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I mean, who gets it? We're adjourned. Thanks for everybody for your patience and thanks everybody online for, for listening.